Able to order the Board of Education meeting for February 11, 2020. I invite you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. It will be led by Drew Zimmerman from Franklin Middle School. After we recite the pledge, I ask everyone to stand for a moment of silence in remembrance of all those that have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, Mr. Zimmerman. The first item on the agenda is the consideration of the agenda of the agenda. Dr. Williams, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? So good evening. There are no changes or addition to tonight's agenda. Hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Open Meetings Act for the following reasons. To one, discuss the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. Seven, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. Eight, consult with staff, consultants, or other individuals about pending or potential litigation and nine, conduct collective bargaining negotiations or consider matters that relate to the negotiations. The minutes of the closed session and informational summary can be found on our website at www.bcps.org slash board slash informational dash summaries dot html. The next item is selection of speakers. Earlier, sign-up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10, the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. The completed sign-up cards for this evening will uh, have been placed in that box, and the first 10 drawn from the box will be our speakers. Mr. Rashid. Our first speaker this evening is Kim Zagurski. Our second speaker is Dr. Bosch Ferrone. Our third speaker is Marcy Phillips. Our fourth speaker is Jennifer Weaver. Our fifth speaker is Anthony, looks like Galagos. Our sixth speaker is Helen Groves. Our seventh speaker is Brandon Luzar. Our eighth speaker is Josh Landers. Our ninth speaker is Melissa Radola. And our final speaker is Colleen Baldwin. Those speakers will call, be called up individually at um, our public comment time. Right now, we are going to conduct our next agenda item, which is new business, personnel matters. And for that, we call forward Ms. Lowry. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chair Hen, Superintendent Williams, and members of the board. I would like the board's consent for the following personnel matters. Retirements, resignations, leaves, deceased recognition of service, and certificated appointments. Board members, do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits E1 5? So moved. Uh, thank you, Ms. Rowe. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Pasteur. Board members, any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. The motion carries unanimously. Thank you. Thank you. The next item is administrative appointments, and for that, we call on Dr. Williams. Madam Chair and members of the board, I would like to bring forward for your approval the following administrative appointments. 
Coordinator, Placement, Office of Special Ed, Compliance and Placement, and Human Resources Officer, Staffing, Department of Human Resources, Recruitment and Staffing. Do I have a motion to approve the administrative appointments as presented in Exhibit F1? So moved. Thank you, Ms. Mack, and we'll have a second from Ms. Pasteur. Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. The motion carries unanimously. Our first candidate is Kanye Bailey. Please stand. Coordinator, Placement, Office of Special Education, Compliance and Placement. She brings to us 22.6 years of experience in Baltimore County. Previously, she served as the Supervisor of Compliance in the Office of Special Education, Compliance and Placement, and a Teacher Resource Department of Special Ed and Student Services, Student Support Services, and a Teacher of Special Ed Self-Contained at Summit Park Elementary. Supporting her this evening is her father, Conway Bailey. Please stand. Congratulations. Our next candidate is Bradley Kahujan, HR Officer and Staffing, Department of Human Resources Recruitment and Staffing. He brings to us 2.1 years of experience in Baltimore County. Previously, he served as an HR Analyst in Staffing in the Department of Human Resources Recruitment and Staffing, and his previous employment was Customer Service Center of IKEA. Today, this evening, supporting him is his wife, Kimberly Kahujan. Please stand and congratulations. Congratulations. Our next item is public comment. This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from our interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the superintendent for follow-up by his staff. While we encourage public input on policies, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting is out of order. I ask you to observe the three minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you see that your time is ending. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time, and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. If not selected, the public may always submit their comments to the board members in hard copy through our staff or at boe at bcps.org. I now call on our stakeholder groups to speak. Uh, I call forward Ms. Lisa McClellan, uh, Chief of Staff from Delegate Michelle Guyton's office. Good evening and welcome. Michelle apologizes for not being able to come. She actually wanted to, but um, they put her hearing last today, so she was getting beaten up in front of the HGO committee this morning, um, this afternoon. Um, so these are her words and not mine, but I'll just read them. Um, Dear Madam, Madam Chair, Dr. Williams, and members of the Board of Education, I am addressing you today while wearing all of my respective hats. I come before you as a member of the Baltimore County Delegation in the Maryland House of Delegates as a member of the Education Subcommittee in Ways and Means, as a developmental psychologist, as the founder of the Maryland State Board Committee on Student Mental Health, and most importantly, as a parent of Baltimore County Public School students. In the General Assembly this session, I look forward to enthusiastically voting for both school construction funding, working to tweak and pass the blueprint for Maryland's future. One of my priorities in the latter bill is to ensure that the blueprint will include stronger provisions that prioritize the mental and behavioral health needs of our students. I am actively working with Senate sponsor, Senator Katie Fester, and advocates, teachers, and mental, school mental health professionals to draft amendments that will address these concerns. I truly appreciate the commitment of BCPS and the superintendent's office to work collaboratively and help with these efforts. I am requesting that BCPS consider implementing our own mental health task force, modeled after that of Anne Arundel County Public Schools, to appropriately respond to the needs of our students. I would also ask that BCPS develop a plan to strategically address the serious shortage of school support personnel, including counselors, psychologists, social workers, and paraprofessionals. 
Staffing levels are currently significantly below the recommended ratios for all of these essential personnel. It is comforting to know that while we are all working hard in Annapolis to increase funding and supports at the state level, we have a county who prioritizes programming that will impact the root causes of our students' behavior and learning issues as well. I look forward to working with BCPS to support all the diverse needs of our students and teachers in the future. Sincerely, Delegate Michelle Guyton. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is Councilman Wade Catch. Good evening and welcome. Superintendent Williams, Chairman of the Board, members of the Board, and my former student, Julie Henn. Uh, I take full credit, <laughs> full credit for her success because I was her math teacher. So uh, what school was, I forget, what school? Perry Hall Middle. Perry Hall Middle, right, right. That's a big school now. Anyhow, I uh, have something to pass out to, oh, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. I'm here tonight to uh, speak about uh, the redistricting plan that you'll be presented tonight uh, regarding Hampton Elementary School and Pleasant Plains Elementary School. Uh, I've taken a look at the plan that from uh, Cropper that you're gonna see tonight and I'm very concerned about uh, the plan because I think that in many ways it's inadequate and does not represent uh, what is ultimately going to happen if Plan B is adopted by the board. Uh, the sheet that you have in front of you, um, first of all, the population projections or the actual number of students in each of uh, Pleasant Plains and Hampton, their September numbers, both schools now have more students in them than is reflected on the study that you'll get later on. In addition, there will be 616 new housing units that are all districted to Hampton Elementary School. And uh, the Baltimore County government has estimated, and I disagree with these numbers, that 25, that these 616 units will produce 25 students for Hampton Elementary School, which I think is rather low. I think it is much higher. So if you look at the top and uh, look, the cropper is going to tell you that they recommend plan B. If you look at the top uh, where it says pre preferred plan B with new developments, uh, instead of the number that you'll see in the cropper report, the actual population at Hampton will be at 100, nearly 110%. So it's already 10% over capacity. Plus on top of it, I have to believe these 616 new housing units are gonna produce more than 25 students for Hampton. So I have real concerns about that. Pleasant Plains, um, there the recommendation plan B will have Pleasant Plains at 110, 111%. Uh, and, and so, you know, what you're doing is you're taking a school that is terribly overcrowded, and now you're overcrowding two schools, which doesn't really make much sense to me. What I've done is I've taken a look at the uh, different population blocks, student population blocks, and if you look at the bottom of the sheet that I've uh, handed out, you'll see that I have a recommendation which will move 39 students from Pleasant Plains, uh, add 43 students to Hampton, and 21 students to Cromwell. If you look at the top, the, uh, to the right of the big black uh, rectangle, 
you'll see that uh, with the changes that I've suggested, that the population at Hampton will be at 97.5%, which is below uh, the capacity of the school. But again, remember, 616 new units being built. And uh, Pleasant Plains, 122%. And Cromwell would go up to 91.5. Um, I, um, you know, we work so hard to get an addition to Hampton Elementary School. When the addition was finished, uh, the cafeteria and the gym were not enlarged, just more classrooms. So, you know, that, that's of great concern. Secondly, uh, during one of the presentations, which I saw from Cropper, the statement was made that, uh, you know, well, maybe we'll have to have trailers at Hampton. Uh, you know, to me, you don't switch students to the point where you're going to overcrowd a school where you need trailers or learning cottages. It just makes no sense to me. So um, the other thing is uh, with, with Pleasant Plains, I don't think 122% overcapacity is reasonable at all. And I think that the school system needs to take a look at some of the facilities close to the school to consider renting some to be used by the kindergarten or pre-K or fifth grade uh, to house some of these students. Because you have this school, which will be 100, under my recommendations, uh, uh, 120 uh, students over capacity. So um, I have there uh, some three suggestions of uh, places that the board, the school system should take a look at uh, for possible renting those facilities. And the last one on the list is Old Lock Raven uh, Elementary School, which uh, is big, part of, parts of it are being used as a senior citizen center, et cetera. Now I hear there's asbestos in the building. We sure aren't exposing our seniors to asbestos, I hope, but uh, I, you know, if asbestos is contained, it's not really a problem. So I think we need to take a look at old uh, Lock Raven Elementary uh, to house these students. Uh, there obviously needs to be a central area or countywide study of our needs for elementary schools in the future that's desperately needed. And so it needs to be an overall plan. And I think that the school system needs to be creative, think outside the box. I hate that term, but I don't think outside the box. And we need to look at other places where we can house students temporarily. So I'd be glad to, add, oh, and the back is, um, shows the map of, uh, this is plan B, and the only thing that I've done is I have one area that would remain at Pleasant Plains. The rest of the recommendations of plan B would be in effect. Just that one area with 61 students. So um, I'd be glad to answer any questions you might have. Uh, Councilman Marks couldn't be here this evening. He and I have worked on this. He and I have met with uh, parents uh, of uh, both schools and to try to come up with a reasonable, rational uh, solution to this problem. So uh, as I said, if there's any questions, I'd be glad to answer them for you. And okay. If board members have questions, they can call or email you. Sure. The, Absolutely. Um, this is not the opportunity for that. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, very you much. Councilman. Okay. Our next speaker for the evening is from the Baltimore County Student Council, Superintendent Student Advisory Council, Ms. Angela Kwan. Good evening and welcome. 
Good evening. Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Student Member of the Board Omar, Superintendent Dr. Williams, and the Board of Education. I'm Angela, I'm the President of the Baltimore County Student Councils. Um, and in past statements, I've spoken about the importance of cultivating a kind environment in our schools. However, as tonight is a budget meeting, I'd like to reiterate the importance of not just altering our attitudes, but making mental health support for students something systematic. From allowing students to access school psychologists to adding mental health to curriculums, BCPS should be doing everything it can to put students' mental health first. This even encompasses raising teachers, social worker, and counselor salaries and treating them well so that they're freer to develop trusting individual relationships with students. And these relationships matter a lot. It really impacts student experience and performance. Um, I'll walk into a classroom and I'll immediately sort of absorb the environment that the teacher creates um, and it'll affect how stressed I feel or how supported I feel for better or for worse. Um, and I'm also really lucky to be able to walk into my guidance counselor's office and immediately feel like calmed and supported. Um, and I want every student to also experience, um, experience that. Um, Students feel supported when educators are valued by the school system. And after all, we're around these adults for eight hours a day. This emphasis on mental health support in all dimensions, including the teacher-student relationship, is something that I'll continue to advocate for as BCSE president and student of BCPS. Throughout tonight, I just urge you all to remember that the decisions you make must serve the students of this county. Our futures depend on our education and our educators. I urge you as board members for the Baltimore County Public Schools to put students first. Thank you for your time. Thank you, and our next speaker for the evening is from Teachers Association of Baltimore County, TABCO President, Ms. Cindy Sexton. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chair Han, Dr. Williams, and members of the board. I hope you were able to see or at least hear part of our rally outside tonight. We had over 500 educators show up to support a great contract and an amazing seventh grader from Lock Raven Technical Academy who spoke as well. Because through our negotiations, TABCO is still trying to make Baltimore County a destination for educators and parents. We want to keep our educators in the system, give them the time and support they need so they can provide our students with an education that raises the bar, closes gaps, and prepares them for the future. Everything in our negotiations package goes back to making BCPS the place for educators and students. As you've heard me say, currently we are 12th in the state for pay and we lose hundreds of teachers a year. To turn that around, the system must respect educators, and that means, among other things, we need to be competitive for pay, have sufficient planning time, and have discipline under control. We've been bargaining since October, and we still don't have what we need on those, our biggest issues. We have offered a package which will help with learning time, pay, planning time, and seat hours, among other things. We've gotten nothing back from the system on that offer. You're preparing to vote on a budget, yet there's not an agreement with us regarding our contract. And the idea that there would be a vote on a budget before settling with your edu educators is disconcerting and doesn't show the respect for the work that we do. And this uncertainty is a problem. Please help us make Baltimore County a destination for educators and parents. Let's do this together. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker this evening is Mr. Tom DeHart from the Council of Administrative and Supervisory Employees. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Hinn, Vice Chair Causey. I'm sorry, reverse that. Maybe there's something I should tell you. I, <laughs> good evening, Chair Causey, Vice Chair Hinn, just to make sure you guys are where you belong, Superintendent Williams and members of the board. You know, you're acutely aware that there's never a downtime during the school year, and the budget review and approval process is especially frantic. Case appreciates the time and energy the board commits to this process. This board has consistently espoused equity across the system, and in that spirit, Case respectfully requests the following budget considerations. First, Case would like a one-time 2% stipend for Case employees. As you're aware, there was a one-year delay of the 2% COLA 
for FY20 for some BCPS employees. At the same time, the Social Security COLA increase for FY20 was 2.8% and is projected at 1.6% for FY21. That's based on the Consumer Price Index. Clearly, case members have lost ground in their standard of living. Members will never recoup this loss without this stipend. Second, case requests a longevity step for employees who have reached the final step on our pay scale. There are valid reasons for this investment in experienced, valid, or valued employees. People are being promoted at a younger age than in years past, and consequently, we are seeing members reaching the 20th step, which is our final step, with significant years left in the system. Currently, we have 58 members on the 20th step, and in three years, there will be 160 members, or 26% of our population. These dedicated folks who have spent a career in BCPS depend solely on a COLA right now just to maintain their quality of life, which I've indicated hasn't kept pace with the Consumer Price Index. The cost of both of these equity issues is less than one-tenth of one percent of the proposed budget. I'm going to say that again. The cost of both of these equity issues is less than one-tenth of one percent of the proposed budget. And it's difficult to imagine this board would not believe that these dedicated employees are not worth this investment. In a January 24th, 2020 article in the Baltimore Sun, Sean Naren, who's a spokesman for the county executive, said that the county is, quote, on significantly stronger fiscal footing than we were a year ago. We didn't get what we asked for a year ago. And now is the time for the school board to ask for what is needed to fund a successful equitable school system. Thank you very much. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is Educational Support Professional of Baltimore County President, Ms. Jeanette Young. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, Chairman Cousins, members of the board, Superintendent Dr. Williams. I come before you this evening to implore that you approve of a sub sustainable and equitable budget. Previously, I petitioned for a budget which includes equitable increase for FTEs for support staff. It is simple, yes, simple, as the student and professional staff increase, office professionals, paraeducators, health assistants, interpreters, technology technician workloads increase. The expected high growth rate of student population requires and demand a robust, robust uh, support staff. Projection in capital growth, increased students' needs and an alarming rate of discipline concerns. Schools and offices are challenged with developing a plan to simply maintain the status quo. More frequently than you may realize, the support staffs are filling gaps in plans, allowing professional staff an opportunity to assist in crisis situations. Again, I say to you, through appropriate staffing, professional development, and salary, you will honor the priorities needed to sustain the school system that the students of Baltimore County deserve. Your adoption of a budget which provides financial compensation to support staff can only provide them with some financial relief. Without financial relief, the compensation gap will continue to grow for ESPs, bargaining unit members. Accolades are great, but they do not pay the bills. According to BCPS eligibility report, 30% of the employees represented by ESPBC have been with BCPS for 15 or more years. Are you aware, according to a Maryland Matter article, BCPS has the largest number of employees from across the state who receive food stamps? How would you feel if those who make decisions for the school system say your contribution is important, but your expertise are too expensive? So you would just not pay you. Additionally, fair and equitable compensation will aid in maintaining and sustaining quality support staff in all areas of the school system. This is something that is desperately needed in our school as well as our central offices. ESPBC priority platform revolves around staffing, workload, salaries, access to technology, and Kronos. Kronos is the time management system for ESPBC bargaining unit members. Too often, ESPs waste valuable time swiping in and out for lunch. Consequently, supervisors and administrators waste time correcting errors due to unforeseeable 
circumstances. Although we recognize that BCPS need to document time work, Chronos impact work time both for ESPs, administrators, and supervisors. Not to say Chronos demoralize the morale of hardworking ESPs. Earning these priorities will highlight the Board of Education belief system by demonstrating its confidence in the contribution ESPs make to our school system. Thank you. Our next speaker for this evening is from the Baltimore County Public School Organization of Professional Employees, Mr. Nick Argyros. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. Good evening, Madam Chair Colsey, Vice Chair Hen, Superintendent Williams, and board members. I represent the Organization of Professional Employees, OPE. OPE sincerely appreciates the benefits you have granted it to us in previous years. We support the superintendent's proposed FY 2021 operating budget, which focuses on providing additional support staff in schools and cost of living wage increases to all BCPS staff. For our school system to be effective, all BCPS staff must be recognized and treated equitably. OP professionals provide vital services to schools, to students and faculty, such as access to technology and learning systems, accounting and budget services, transportation, maintenance of buildings and grounds, food for our students, and many other essential services enabling students and staff to be successful. We ask that you provide a cost of living increase to the OP employees no less than all the other bargaining units. Equitable compensation acknowledges and sends a message that all BCPS employees are essential to the success of our school system. In addition to the cost of living increase, we also ask that you fund the three additional request to pay scale steps. We have 53 OP employees that have reached the last salary step in our pay scale due to their many years of service. And as a result, they have not received annual pay increases for years. Again, we thank you for your support in the past and we appeal to you to continue pr to provide fair and impartial compensation. Thank you and good night. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is American Federation of State, County and Municipal Employees, Mr. David Bassler. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, Dr. Williams, Chairperson Causey, Vice Chair Hen, ladies and gentlemen of the Baltimore County Board of Education. I am David C. Basler, Ask Me Local 434 Executive Board Member. I've been asked by Brian Epps, our President, to address you at this meeting. As past President of Ask Me Local 434, my issues and concerns are well documented. Today, I draw your attention to our current staffing shortages. Those that are due to vacancies and long-term absences. The lack of adequate staffing is a condition that perpetuates itself, causing stress on those left to carry the burden of picking up the gap in service left by the vacancy. The lack of staffing is a continued concern for all of us. As you set the budget, the spending priorities, you can and should begin to solve many of the serious conditions where we find our organization currently. You can advance us towards the minimum of a living wage for all our, our employee groups. Right the ship, eliminate the inequities in a top heavy organization. Compensate folks competitively, comparably with other nearby local jurisdictions and government agencies. Please don't continue with past failures. Learn from what put us here. Thank you all, have a great evening. Thank you. Our next speaker this evening is from the Southwest Area Education Advisory Council, Ms. Marlena Purcell. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, President, <clears throat> board members, and Dr. Williams. I'm sorry, my voice is scratchy. 
Um, my name is Marlena Colleton Purcell, and I am the chair of the Southwest Area of Advis Education Advisory Council. And I'm here today um, to give you a brief summary of our meeting that happened in January, in which we had the Office of Advanced Academics. It was at this meeting that several parents expressed their concern with the very a large class size in the GT6 math classes, specifically at two of the middle schools in our area. Um, while we were very, parents were very concerned with um, these large class size, but more so concerned with the fact that th that um, it doesn't seem to get any smaller. And they were really concerned that if the scheduling could happen or staffing happens in the spring, why the class sizes were so large in the fall. Um, just recently at our February meeting, we had our board members present and we had a nice conversation and several parents um, brought up the fact that recently there are, uh, I believe, seven or eight employees that has been um, released from the academic office back into the uh, classrooms or of their choice. And we were very concerned that these um, resource staffs that are skilled in a mindset of social, emotional, and also just the whole theories of uh, GT education, that um, it would not be equitable because we're we not, quite frankly, we don't know where they're going. Um, they're released back in, but never enough, we as parents, we felt that it would have been better to know the why. Um, we simply just um, wanted just to make those viewpoints clear in that advanced academics office that now has one coordinator, one staff member, and a um, administrative assistant. It's very slighting to know that um, these staff members went from having a office now to two employees, um, and we simply just wanted to know the why. I thank you for your time tonight, and I yield my time over to Julie, who is a GTCAC, when she gets up. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> and our next speaker for the evening is Ms. Julie Miller-Britz from the Citizens Advisory Council on Gifted and Talented Education. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, thank you. Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, board members, Dr. Williams, and the BCPS community. February is Gifted and Talented Month in Maryland, and tonight is the awards night for the Excellence in Gifted and Talented Education, a statewide celebration of those who have done outstanding work in the field. In fact, BCPS has two students, a teacher from Lock Raven High School and a resource teacher from the Office of Advanced Academics who are being honored there tonight. Yet this is also the month when we heard that BCPS is planning on returning 34 resource teachers from the central office to the schoolhouse and that seven of these 34 come from the Office of Advanced Academics. This would be an 88% reduction in this office from eight resource teachers down to one. The thought is that the STAT teachers, now becoming staff development teachers, will get professional monthly learning opportunities and gifted and talented and that they will return this information back to the school and distill it out through teachers and administrators in partnership with the gifted facilitators at every school and thereby obviating the need for resource teachers at the central office level. What this new model does not take into account is the incredible amount of knowledge, expertise, and experience that these teachers have and the incredible amount of work that they do. Four out of the seven resource teachers being transferred have won awards from the Maryland State Department of Education for Excellence in Gifted Education. They have decades of combined experience in gifted education. They have GT certification. They have taught graduate level GT courses. They have attended dozens of national and state conferences to learn from the top experts, experts researchers, and practitioners in the field. Their expertise has taken years to amass and cannot be repli replicated with professional development delivered in hour per month sessions spread over 12 months. They provide one-on-one -on -one instructional coaching, professional development to teachers, facil facilitators, grade level teams, departments, and entire faculties across the system, and online professional development in the form of Schoology courses. They have written curriculum 
in collaboration with social studies, ELA, math, and science, and have also worked with GT Art, World Languages, and ESOL. They've incorporated enrichment resources in math and provided PD to schools about how to utilize those resources. They've collaborated with AP teachers in all subjects to incorporate depth and complexity models to AP classrooms. They've attended and provided feedback to all articulation meetings between elementary and middle schools. They provide process support for schools around acceleration procedures and universal screening procedures, and they assess students for subject and grade level acceleration. It is completely unrealistic to think that an office with one coordinator and one resource teacher can continue to do all of this. If the strategy is to provide better support and services to GT students and BCPS, then the execution and expected outcome of this new strategy should be well defined. How are GT students better served when the office that serves them is gutted and those with the deepest bank of knowledge are returned to schools and capacities that may or may not utilize their experience in GT education? Keeping the resource teachers in place and getting resources to schools are not mutually exclusive. BCPS should be looking at how to do both because that is what would best serve students. Thank you for your time. Thank you very much. Our next speaker for the evening is uh, President of PTA Council of Baltimore County, Ms. Jane Lee. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, Chairwoman Causey. Ms. Han, Dr. Williams, board members. PTA's first job is to advocate for the health and safety of students. And in PTA Council, we have always been a proponent for human support for students over technology. Technology is good, but it can't tell when a child is hungry, abused, bullied, and it can't see the signs of a suicidal student. And that is growing way too high in this county and across the state. So we are in support of mental health support for students, psychologists, counselors, social workers, and paraeducators. Para While we're happy that there have been some increases, we do not meet the recommended numbers and standards for those areas. And that is what is most important to our children is that support. It will help school climate. It will help curb bullying, hopefully cut down on teenage suicides and now even elementary school suicides. It will help with learning interpersonal relationship skills and cutting back on the devices and having interpersonal relationships will also help the vision of many of our students. Now, in PTA, our hands are tied when it comes to speaking about personnel issues or labor negotiations, but we do want more teacher retention and whatever it takes to keep those teachers we want. We realize in the same way your hands are tied when it comes to talking about specific students or issues or cases that we've been reading about in the media. And we want to make it clear to everyone that we understand that so we are not jumping on the bandwagon of asking you to speak out about that. But in general, we need human support to help our kids. Thursday night, we will be going to Annapolis and meeting up with other PTA leaders from across the state for PTA night in Annapolis, which um, we will talk about adequate buildings, safe buildings, and fully funding all public schools before any money goes elsewhere. Because our children are our future, and we need these things to give ourselves a future and our country a future. Thank you. Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chairwoman Hen, Dr. Williams, members of the board, good evening. First, I want to say a word about the resource teachers being reallocated from the central office to the schools. The OSC is losing about four positions. While I'm not thrilled about the loss of any positions anywhere, it may be possible for the Office of Special Ed to cover the loss with minimal impact to schools this time. This is true because the office may be able to use grant funds or contractors to offset the change. 
That said, in a system where we are always behind in staffing, taking one from one place to serve another doesn't make stakeholders feel like we're truly gaining any ground. You're creating a situation where every time a group thinks they've advocated for positions and receives them, they can disappear at any time. Furthermore, CCAC has asked multiple times for an assessment of our central office staff and structure, believing we may be understaffed when compared to other counties of similar size. I urge the board to be in conversation with us specifically about central office staff over the next year. Second, I want to commit on I want to comment on the question from some board members regarding contractual positions and expenses. While I can't speak to all contractors, the ones associated with the Office of Special Ed are crucial for its work. Because we are short-staffed in several areas, these contractors fill significant gaps. For example, there is a critical shortage of SLPs in Maryland. Even if we added more full-time positions to our budget, we could not fill them because the bodies aren't available. Contractual relationships with OTs, PTs, speech therapists, BCBAs, and others help ensure services are delivered as needed for our students. I urge this board to protect contractual positions associated with the office. Office of Special Ed. And finally, while we have many priorities, at the moment staffing in schools is our most important issue. Given both large caseloads and many students with complex needs, one of the most critical items in this budget is the number of full-time new positions. 51 10-month positions are being requested for a combination of teachers and paraeducators. 10 12-month positions are being requested for birth to five, also a combination of teachers and paraeducators. These 61 total positions cannot be negotiable. It sounds like a big number, but significant gaps still exist even with these additions, so we cannot afford to lose even one of these new positions in negotiation or the gap will continue to increase. CCAC urges this board to protect all 61 of the new full-time positions in the budget, and we thank you for your continued listening and work with regard to staffing in our schools. Thank you. Thank you. I now call on our public speakers, and first we have Ms. Kim Zagurski. <clears throat> Good evening and welcome. Um, good evening, board members and Dr. Williams. My name is Kim Zagurski, and I didn't plan on speaking tonight, um, so forgive me if I stumble. Um, I'm just a teacher, no fancy title behind my name, um, but I'm just a small voice and I feel like it needs to be heard. So I'm here with six other teachers from my school we have a combined um, service to Baltimore County of 136 years of serving students. And in our time, we've seen Baltimore County go through many changes. Um, we used to have um, involved families and informed leadership and high academic standards, uh, high, acad uh, high behavior standards for all students. Um, our system, when we were talking, now doesn't have that as much. We feel like there is lack of support, lack of consequence, lack of vision, um, trauma, anxiety, medicated students, medicated teachers, bruises. We're weary, but we're hopeful. We're hopeful that the board will listen to us. Uh, they'll address these discipline needs, that they'll fund special education services, um, they'll treat us with respect and finally pay us what we're worth. Um, that's the only way you're going to recruit or retain quality teachers. Thank you. Yes, thank you. And our next speaker is Dr. Bosch Ferrone. Good evening and welcome. Good evening to all. I'm also a small voice, I like to be heard. Um, I'm here today in support of the current commission recommendations. Teachers do need to be paid more. They do need to have COLA. They do need to have 
extra support, whatever it is, whether it's humans or equipment. However, as always, my question, where do we get the money from? I ask you not to do anything to raise our property taxes. And I suggest that you would implore both county and state to use the sin tax as much as they can to support our educational system. Alcohol, gambling, cigarettes, jewel, vaping. And actually, why not? Put an extra tax on French fries and <laughs> fried chicken. <laughs> really, I mean, you know, how much of these things really add to our healthcare system? You know, it costs so much, people die earlier, require more surgery and so forth. So whatever you really you do, I really ask you not to raise our property tax. Because property tax, if it is raised, it's already high. It will affect the poor people, it will affect senior citizens. And um, we just need to find some other ways of generating the money. I mentioned to you before that I really like the system to entertain the idea of the board levying your own taxes. Now, some 20 years ago, or maybe 15 year, years ago, I advocated for elected board officials. Early, early on, nobody really knew me. And now it's a reality. So please consider that, all right? Because otherwise, people will ask, and they want to be paid for the cost of the extra school system from somewhere. And it really has to come. People have to have a, a, a foot in the fire, so to speak. Last but not least, if we can really implore on our county officials not to give permits and construct more when they know that we have overcrowded schools. It just really makes no sense. And uh, we did have our councilman here. This is really a good opportunity to impress on the county council um, to put some sort of moratorium. And if you have to change the laws, please appeal to our elected officials in the state and the county to change the laws to, to allow that, if that's really the, uh, the issue about it. Thank you. Thank you. And our next speaker for this evening is Ms. Marcy Phillips. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chairwoman Hen, Dr. Williams, and board members. Thank you for having me. My name is Marcy Phillips, and I am a TAPCO member here to talk about professional pay. We, the certified educators of Baltimore County, are a highly educated group. We've collectively spent millions upon millions of dollars to gain subject matter and educational expertise. We are one of the most highly trained workforces in the country, but we aren't paid like other highly trained professionals. Though we need the same amount of education as accountants and architects, we are paid a fraction of what people in those professions earn. But you have entrusted us with the future of Baltimore County. Does that make any sense? Baltimore County loses hundreds of certified professionals every year and then spends additional hundreds of thousands of dollars recruiting and onboarding their replacements. This has happened numerous times in my building alone. This revolving door is a huge waste. Many of these educators are leaving to go to better paid districts. In this state, they have 11 other counties to go to. Because as President Sexton said, we are ranked 12th in educator pay. Is that where you want us to be, esteemed members of the board? The third largest county ranked 12th in pay. How can we recruit and retain great educators from the 12th position? And that's before we talk about pay practices. We can't even get a 12-month pay option here. It's very frustrating. You as a board have voted in support of the Kerwin Commission's recommendation for higher educator pay. 
they are calling for real raises, a starting salary of $60,000, and an average salary that is competitive with the states of New Jersey and Massachusetts. The way we make that happen here is we bargain a contract that moves us in that direction. We call on you to work with us collaboratively at the table to reach those goals. That is in your control to do. We want to keep our coworkers as coworkers. We want to watch our new educators become veterans. Our students deserve it, and Baltimore County deserves it. Thank you for your time. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is Ms. Jennifer Weaver. Good evening and welcome. Hi. Good evening, Dr. Williams, board members. My name is Jen. I'm wearing two hats tonight. Um, first, as a parent of Pleasant Plains Elementary School, I ask that the board accepts, accepts the recommendation of the Boundary Study Committee of option B as presented as a first step to alleviate our overcrowding problem. My friend Colleen has been picked to speak and she'll speak more about that later. Second, I'm a TABCO member with 18 years of experience teaching in Baltimore County Public Schools. In the interest of the rest of my time, let me get right to it. We don't have enough planning time. We don't have time to plan, grade, enter student data, differentiate teaching for all of our students. Those of us with caseloads don't have time to manage them as our caseloads keep growing and growing and growing. Our current master agreement says we get 250 minutes minimum of planning a week. Even if we got all of those minutes every week, which we absolutely do not, it would not be enough to do the work we do. An educator's life calls for nights and weekends, but shouldn't call for all of our nights and all of our weekends. I have coached new and veteran teachers work through stress and tears and still, despite my best efforts to help them and the support that they're getting, still end up quitting. All of the members here tonight have seen new teachers and veterans quit from being overwhelmed. We've seen special educators pulling their hair out, trying to do right by their students, and also get some time with their own families. This is not what a world-class education system looks or feels like for educators. Don't our students deserve a world-class system? When we see our students struggling to achieve and our system struggling to keep faculty, is it really a mystery? Without proper planning, we cannot reach our potential as educators, and if we can't do that, how can we mentor our students to reach their potential? As a Board of Education, you voted to support the recommendations of the Kerwin Commission. Those recommendations call for massive increases in planning time. Teachers to plan 40% of their day and 60% of their day teaching. We currently plan less than 20% of our day and teach for over 80%. You can help BCPS make these recommendations a reality right now at our bargaining table. You don't have to wait for Annapolis. You can just work with us today. I call on you to step up and take bold action on planning time. The time, as they say, is now. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is Mr. Anthony Pelagos. Did I say that correctly, sir? Pelagos. 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 Welcome. Uh, to the chair, vice chair, and Dr. Williams, members of the board, I'm here today to speak on behalf of the property owners, uh, Sandy and David Den, at 113 Woodman's Court, to offer you the other side of the story with respect to the staff's recommendations. Excuse me, sir. Um, I've been advised that uh, you're not supposed to speak to uh, specific matters. Is this? Okay, excuse me, you may continue. As to, uh, uh, on behalf of the DENS, and to give the other side of the story to the staff's recommendation to, uh, to deny their request to continue the use of what has been called an encroached area. 
the staff is correct. The staff is correct that the use of this area in question started back in 1988. It was pursuant to a lease that did expire when the owners of that property transferred title in, 2000, in 2002. The distinction that would hopefully convince this board to continue the use is that the use continued lawfully in 1988 and has, con and has continued to be used in the capacity that is being used up until the first letter of the board and the, uh, the staff attorney, staff, office of staff, asking us to stop the use in 2017. I would submit to the board that A, the use was started lawfully under the authority of a board to execute a lease, that the use has continued even after the lease has expired by its own terms in a manner that's been open and visible to the pub public at large, and that the, this board would have the authority to continue that use. We listened to the staff's recommendations uh, at today's committee meeting and that um, there was concern about precedent, which the pre precedent was established in 1988, and I asked this board to consider the following question. If it's a minor change to revise the plans that would allow the encroached area to continue the way it is, then this board should consider a revision of the plans because I asked this question. The position of the staff has been that to revise the plan, to, even if the plans to go through with the expansion is allowed, it will cause, based on the current plans, it will cause flooding to this property owner. So to me and to my clients, it seems like it's a minor revision for the plans if it can be done that would allow the encroached area, not interfere with the drainage, to avoid intentionally flooding the neighbor's property. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is Helene Groves. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chairwoman Hen, Dr. Williams. Uh, and board members. My name is Helen Groves, and I am a TABCO member here to talk about student discipline uh, on behalf of all of the TABCO members. Can you imagine trying to work, let alone teach, after watching one student assault another with a belt buckle? Can you imagine trying to get the attention of 25 young people after the police have arrested a child outside of your classroom? Can you imagine teaching kindergartners after one of their classmates picked up and threw a chair and then proceeded to destroy the classroom? These are not all scenarios that have occurred to me, but this is what teachers face every day within our school systems, teachers and students. Our students' lives are often full of stress and trauma, and that comes out at school, where many of these kids feel safe, which is a good thing. But the structure is what these children need. That is where the sense of safety and order come from. We have failed as a system to provide sufficient support to classroom teachers to establish and enforce the structures needed to create safety and order in our classrooms and schools. TABCO has been intensely working on disciplinary issues for three years, and yet, it's a victory to even get an agreement from BCPS that every school should have a school discipline plan. Let that sink in for a minute. Your own board policy, 5510, already calls for all schools to have a plan. But all of our schools do not have functional discipline plans in place. As we say in TABCO, a discipline plan won't solve your discipline problem, but you won't solve your discipline problems without a plan. There are relatively easy changes that can be made, and we propose some of them in bargaining already. We've also proposed language to address teacher trauma, another major issue that is driving educators from the classroom, unfortunately. We beg of you, as our school board, hear what educators are saying and help us to address these critical issues. We can't go on this way. 
It's driving educators from the classroom, and it's driving students from the schoolhouse. Let's make smart, bold changes together through bargaining and through policy work. We must change the condition of discipline in our schools and classrooms. Let's change it for the better and without delay. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Brandon Luzar. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, members of the board. Thanks for taking the time to listen to me. Um, so past BCPS boundary studies have utilized enrollment projections when supportive of BCPS's predetermined agenda. In the case of the Pleasant Plains boundary study, enrollment projections and projected development do not support the boundary changes that BCPS is proposing. After the Pleasant Plains boundary study was announced in June of 2019, BCPS revised Rule 1280 to determine to deprioritize enrollment projections. Accordingly, enrollment projections and, develop, and development have been omitted from the study. Using current BCPS projections and accounting for realistic development, the study will, by 2023, make Hampton the largest elementary school by more than 100 students in the Towson and Timonium area. Hampton will still have common areas that are designed for population close to half of its projected enrollment. Comparing Hampton with 14 other elementary schools that are the closest, in, that are the closest to the populations being redistricted, Hampton will be the third most overcrowded elementary school by 2023. The first and second most overcrowded elementary schools will be Hampton's neighbors, Timonium and Pine Grove. Hampton is the only school with significant development approved, 616 units. Um, Councilman earlier talked about it. All of this development is coming online prior to next school year. BCPS has claimed this development is conceptual and won't be built within the next five years. Currently, more units are in the planning phase within the Hampton zone than are being built. Heaver Plaza, Red Maple, many others to name a few. So more than the 616 that are referenced as coming online prior to next year. In aggregate, zooming out, looking at those 14 elementary schools as a group, the 14 schools are currently at 108% capacity with enrollment expected to remain flat across BCPS's time frame. At current enrollments, a 450 seat school would solve the immediate overcrowding problem. However, two points, six of the 14 schools do not have pre-K programs. Number two, after the financial crisis in 2008, BCPS elementary school enrollments grew by about 5% within four years as the public versus private school enrollment rate increased and overall public and private enrollments remained flat. If another financial crisis were to cause similar increases in enrollment across the 14 public elementary schools, the schools would be 800 seats overcrowded or at 113% capacity, still without pre-K in six of the 14 schools. In the Towson and Timonia area, we need another 700 seat or two 450 seat schools. 20 years ago, Baltimore County had 50 year old elementary schools that needed to be modernized and were neglected by the, by the generation prior to mine. Today, we have 70 year old schools that are over capacity and need to be modernized. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening. Our next speaker for the evening is Mr. Josh Landers. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. <clears throat> I have two guests that are gonna sit with me, they won't speak. Board members, thanks for taking a couple of minutes. My name is Josh Landers, I'm the co-founder of the Parent to Parent Network. School violence is going unchecked. It is happening every single day in BCPS. Convicted felons are allowed to attend our schools. Registered sex offenders are allowed to attend schools. I understand that there are lots of folks that are new in their roles, both elected and appointed, but this needs to be addressed. Silence speaks volumes. Two weeks to release statements to legislators, three weeks to release a statement to BCPS families. I have a Parkville mom and a Parkville student here that are looking for answers. Statistics say that somewhere near 200 convicted felons are roaming BCPS hallways right now. 
Would you please tell us how many convicted felons are in the system? There's no violations to FERPA, so there should be no issue to address this today. So that the 115,000 students, the 9,000 teachers, many of whom are represented here tonight, can be safe going to school tomorrow. When you release that information, uh, will you release that to the parents and the students of the schools where they attend? What is precluding you from being able to do that immediately? You are all charged with the education and safety of 115,000 of our most precious gifts. I have six children myself, five sons and one daughter. It would be prudent for you to act quickly. I beg you not to wait for legislative solutions and rule changes and policies. I implore you to do the right thing, which I know each one of you has a heart, and you have children and grandchildren, and maybe not children yet, um, but you have friends that are students. This would touch you deeply in the most hard places if something bad were to happen. And I have talked to victims, I have talked to family members that have lost students. You never want to do that. So I beg you to act today, not tomorrow, today. I beg you to be transparent about it. I, I, I beg you to consider what it would feel like if you were on the receiving end. And I thank you very much for your time. Thank you for allowing my guests to come up and sit with me. Thank you. Our next speaker for the evening is Ms. Melissa Rodala. Good evening and welcome. Good evening. I'm here to discuss the Pleasant Plains Elementary Capacity <coughs> Relief Boundary Study. This study is not adequate. It does not take into consideration the new construction of 600 plus housing units within the Hampton School Zone. The boundary study does not fix the problem. It only causes another problem. Our cafeteria and gym, which are our common spaces, cannot handle option B the way it is currently stated. I do not stand alone on this topic. I'd like to present a petition, petition signed by 492 community members. I'll be leaving a copy for each of you. This petition goes into lots of detail. It brings about 20 or so students from planning blocks 201, 202, 209, 210, and 211. These planning blocks, they adhere to rule 1280. We would consider another relief for Pleasant Plains by reallocating planning blocks 231 to Hampton Elementary, Cromwell Valley, or another school. This alternative plan would increase the total reassignment to about 40 students, with a student yield of approximately 20 from this additional planning block. It would not tip the scales at Hampton Elementary immediately, but would lead to overcrowding within a three-year time frame. The Hampton community does not entirely object to the inclusion of this planning block, but maintains the investment in Pleasant Plains would best serve both schools. As you will see by the response from our community, we stand strong requesting this study to be paused to be able to consider all options and schools in a comprehensive way. Looks like I still have a minute and 25 seconds, so speaking from my heart, I have one child right now who's in third grade, and I have another child who will be entering kindergarten next year, and then soon to be crazy, my two-year-old will be there soon enough. But the thought of putting my ch children in a school in a relocatable that was just removed less than a decade ago is frightening, it's sad. Thinking about a child being put on a bus from one county to another, I mean, one part of the county to another part without a seatbelt on a highway, that's scary as a parent. And I'm sure I look at each of you, you can all understand that. And as you've heard all these teachers tonight speak about the behavior problems and the, what it stands for, we're not the only school right now that's overcrowded. We're not the only school that's facing these problems. So I look at each of you, what are you doing to solve this problem? What is our tax money being used for? How can we work together as parents and as you, as our administration, to help resolve these problems. I personally, I'm invested. I was in a private school and now I'm here at Baltimore County and I will do whatever it takes to help you. But there are lots of schools in this district that are overcrowded and a solution needs to be made. And I really hope that you hear us and you will take all these things into consideration. I'm gonna leave this here, if I can pass this on to somebody. Thank you. Thank you. Our final speaker for the evening. 
Our final speaker for the evening is Ms. Colleen Baldwin. Good evening and welcome. Hi, good evening, nice to see you again. Um, good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chair Hen, Dr. Williams and members of the board. My name is Colleen Baldwin and I am here tonight as a Pleasant Plains parent and a BCPS spouse. I appreciate this forum as always to share my thoughts on the Boundary Study Committee's recommendation. It's no secret that Pleasant Plains is currently one of the most overcrowded schools in the county and that we have maintained enrollment of over 700 students for 16 months. I was thrilled to learn of the boundary study process at the end of last year, and despite my significant misgivings about the use of 2018 data, remained a patient observer and supporter of the process. Tonight, the committee is submitting what I believe to be the best available option to provide short-term relief to Pleasant Plains. It is a plan that shifts the bulk of impacted students to Hampton and avoids kicking the overcrowding can, so to speak, to Halstead, a school that isn't far behind us in its capacity issues. You've already heard opposition to the recommendation tonight, including the online petition advocating that only 24 students move to Hampton, suggesting that a more comprehensive boundary study and capital improvement project take place instead. While I believe the motives behind this petition are very well intentioned, their proposal is at best incredibly short-sighted. Furthermore, Delegate Catch's suggestion that the former Lock Raven Elementary be considered in the short term is simply unreasonable given its state of disrepair. That building had been previously considered in recent years with renovation costs last estimated in excess of $50 million. The fact of the matter is we need substantial relief right now. Not only are we at 130% of our capacity, our building does not have adequate core spaces for its state-rated capacity of 545 students. We have 710 kids, eight trailers, and no more room to grow. Make no mistake, this is not an either-or proposition for Pleasant Plains. Approving the relief suggested by the Boundary Committee is not ideal but is necessary, as is maintaining the staffing that we fought tooth and nail for last year and a capital improvement project that supports either a renovation or a new building. We have every intention of keeping this issue in the forefront of your minds and look forward to moving ahead with this first step. Our door is always open for any of you to visit, and we hope that Dr. Williams can make his first visit to our school in the very near future. We'd love to have you for lunch. It starts around 10.30 in the morning. In closing, I implore you to work with TABCO on an agreement whose monetary value begins to match the value we purport our educators deserve and allows for the option for 12-month pay. My family is counting on it and counting on you for all of this and more. Thank you for your time. Thank you, and thank you to everyone that came and was not able to speak. Our next item on the agenda is the superintendent's report, and we turn it over to Dr. Williams. So good evening, everyone. I would like to begin by acknowledging Black History Month and thanking our schools for delving into the rich history of our African Americans. One example is Black Saga, a regional competition focused on African American history and culture that is taking place tonight and tomorrow with the countywide finals on February 22nd. In addition, our Team BCPS blog on exposure provides a timeline for the creation of public school system in Baltimore County through the development of separate college schools, through segregation to integration and the appointment of the first African-American superintendent. Last week, Team BCPS celebrated our first college day. I appreciate the, the enthusiasm I saw from students and staff across the county and from school leaders at our monthly principals leadership development meeting. We know that great jobs in this economy require at least some college and we are proud to show students that there is a college for them. I want all high school seniors who aspire to teach to know that applications are now being received for the BCPS scholarship loan program, which offers up to $4,000 per year for up to four years. Growing our own teachers will, will help diversify our future workforce so that students see teachers who look like them. Yesterday, a team from Human Resources wrapped up job fairs in Puerto Rico as part of an effort to recruit 
Spanish-speaking staff for a variety of roles as we welcome more Latinx or Latino, Latina children to our schools. As you know, the stakeholder survey is now available for all children, staff, parents, community members. We received more than 31,000 responses, but we want to hear from everyone. So please go to bcps.org to take the survey and help guide our future budget staffing and programs. And as a report, as of today, I have visited 105 schools out of 175 school centers and programs. Again, my goal is to complete all 175 by the end of this school year. And finally, as a reminder, President's Day will be a regular school day with schools and offices open on Monday, February 17th. Thank you, that includes my report. Thank you, and that uh, leads us to our next agenda item, the student board members report. Mr. Rashid. Excuse me. Oh, excuse me, it's my report. Good evening. It is wonderful to see so many of our teachers, paraeducators, bus drivers, counselors, principals, administrators, facilities, staff, and essential staff from all aspects of our school system, including our bargaining units, OPE, CASE, AFSME, ESPBC, and TABCO. Uh, the board has been working very hard on the budget and we'll be addressing that in another work session later this evening and then voting on it in our um, meeting that comes in two weeks. I just uh, will make my comments brief given the time. Um, board member engagement is very high on the board and later this evening board members will uh, speak for themselves about their activities, their engagements, and in their board service. But I did want to point out that in conjunction with Black History Month, Mr. Rod McMillian and I did attend the first TABCO Black Lives Matter in school event. Um, it was a very powerful event with a uh, dynamic and courageous student panel that really spoke to issues and concerns that our students are, are dealing with on a daily basis. Um, it was wonderful to have two of our teachers of the year there, Mr. Brendan Penn and Ms. Kristen Nielsen. So it was a wonderful event um, and uh, I asked people to look forward and follow it. It's going to be on our uh, board website. Additionally, four board members, Ms. Joes, Ms. Scott, Ms. Rowe, and Ms. Pasteur attended the National School Board Association Equity Conference that was in Washington, D.C., and also Mr. Rashid, our uh, student member of the board, attended another session on equity. Um, this month in Mind Over Matters, uh, in dealing with relationships, our student member of the board on his Omar's uh, chat cafe hosted uh, One Love Foundation Advocate, and I encourage students and stakeholders to watch. It's very important that our students learn about relationships, and this is an organization that has done a wonderful job in raising awareness. Um, also, as we focus on student mental health, we must also address physical safety. And the board is committed to providing for every student the highest quality education in a safe, secure, and positive environment. The board has heard a great deal from the community regarding the issue that arose recently um, about a student uh, who was enrolled in school. And I want to assure everyone that the board is committed to the safety and security of all of these students attending Baltimore County Public Schools. The board has heard the concerns expressed by the public and by elected officials and is looking into all aspects of it. We're also reviewing our current policies and procedures. It is important to emphasize that while safety and security of students is a paramount concern, the board is also required to follow existing legal requirements regarding the education of all students who reside in Baltimore County and those provisions regarding the confidentiality of student records and information. And all employees of the school system also have those, um, those responsibilities. As we move forward with review of policies and procedures, we must keep all of these statutory requirements in mind. I do want to say that recently uh, the Policy Review Committee has addressed and as a regular course of reviewing policies um, and we are, have sent back to staff to uh, review them for some additional strengthening along the lines of student safety. We want to support Dr. Williams who has stated publicly moving forward no student with such serious criminal convictions will be allowed to attend school with other students. As necessary, we will utilize alternative ways to provide the legally required education to which all students are entitled. 
Also recently, we've heard from legislators uh, that may be uh, drafting legislation. We have a legislative and government relations committee, and they will be following any bills that are dropped. They um, do not have a number currently, but the legislative and government relations committee is meeting tomorrow. The agendas for all of our committee meetings are online at bcps.org under the leadership tab, and those meetings are also open to the public. Uh, again, later this evening, you'll hear from each board member about their board service, and that is my report. And so now I call on Mr. Rashid. Good evening. It's February Black History Month and Relationship Matters Month, and with the help of BCPS TV and the One Love Organization, be sure to check out the video on healthy relationships on our third episode of Chat Cafe. Since December, we have been receiving applications for the next student member of the Board of Education, and we finally have our top three finalists who, will be, who we will be working with to get their speeches and question and answer sessions for the students to view and vote for their next student member of the board. Last week, I got the opportunity to go to the National School Boards Association Conference and talk about the great work of BCPS and our innovative ways of teaching. I was also asked by the National School Boards Association what I would want to ask Congress for support with as they were headed there the next day. And I want to share with the board and the public a piece of what I mentioned and focus on, which was teachers. Start of my quote, with BCPS and our new leadership from our superintendent, Dr. Williams, we are focusing more on in the in classroom works, which means having teachers that will provide students with the best instructions and tools needed, especially for special education students, ESOL students, and of course, all 115,000 students of Baltimore County Public Schools. But to do this, we need more teachers. To have more teachers, we need more money. To have more people wanting to be teachers, we need a higher salary for our teachers. With all teachers do, including things that aren't included in the job description, which isn't as pretty as most students and teachers know, they definitely deserve more. After all, they're the ones shaping tomorrow's generation. End of my quote. With that being said, <laughs> with that being said, Within the past few weeks, I've heard concerns from teachers, speech language pathologists, media specialists, and TAPCO members about their many concerns, and most importantly, how it is affecting our students. We need to be able to give teachers more planning time and do our best to keep them in our system. We also cannot forget about students' mental health, which again means having support and personnel with counselors, social workers, and school psychologists. I don't get a vote on the budget, but I hope we'll keep the students in mind with the decisions we make. I hope we put the students above all. Thank you. Thank you. The next item is action taken in closed session, but we did not take action in closed session. The next item is new business contract awards, and for that I call on the committee chair, Ms. Hen. Thank you. Members of the board, the board's building and contracts committee met earlier this evening. Items L1 through L7 are being forwarded to the full board for approval. Items, item L8 is being forwarded without a recommendation for, from the committee. Thank you. Is it possible, Ms. Hen, to separate contract um, related to space, the modification. You can is it ask for a motion. Do you have a motion? No, I, um, I want to make a motion to separate the contract for uh, rental space. Okay. Is there a second? It's item three, item number three. Any discussion? All in favor? So we can separate that. Sure. We don't normally do that, but I'm sorry. Can you raise your hands again? I just want to separate one contract. Okay, motion carries, thank you. Do I have a motion to approve items L1 and L2, L4 through L7? I have a question. 
Is there a second? And then. Okay. Um, any discussion? Yes, Ms. Joes. For item L4, temporary staffing for accounting, the $750,000, is that for a five year contract or is that annual? Could we have staff come forward, please? Good evening, Mr. Saris. Uh, good evening. So we're talking about item three? L4. Four, okay. Uh, that is a five year contract, and it's really just based on projected expenditures. Um, we've looked at uh, historical spending over many years, which typically is less than $25,000, but um, uh, we're projecting that in total we'll probably exceed that in a year, and so we've, uh, we've made this five-year projection for purposes of this contract doesn't, we don't have a budget. Each office would use their own uh, operating budgets to cover these costs. There's no central budget for temporary uh, employees of this nature. So that works out to about $150,000 a year? Correct. Uh, for five years? Correct. And is that equally split or is it just based on needs on your uh, it's going to be based on long-term vacancies that need to be addressed while administrative uh, matters are uh, resolved yeah. long-term vacant you know illnesses that type of thing thank you okay board members other questions or discussion all those in favor please raise your hand any opposed? Any abstain? That motion carries. Um, I did want to address item L4. Excuse me, item L3. I was writing down your thing. Item uh, L3. I was curious why the, um, and I apologize I wasn't able to make it to buildings and contracts earlier, but why is the modification for $500,000 when the um, Average annual, annual expenditures um, would not take us to the to the full um, authority that we've already approved one million five hundred in the time frame. Would you like me to answer? Sure, uh, Mrs. Causey. We uh, expect uh, because of one of the venues that we use most often has closed and was the cheapest amount that we would spend that the projections are actually larger than the actuals because now the new places just cost more than the old place we used costed cost since since there is still spending authority and time left <coughs> would i think it would be more feasible to rebid the contract and see if there are some additional lower cost vendors that would be available rather than just settling to pay more well, we did have a very uh, high level of participation with this bid. Um, it's probably also noteworthy that the low cost option uh, is in bankruptcy. Um, so I, in looking at the, uh, let's see, what is it, uh, three, the nine providers, um, I think we have a fairly uh, good representation of the marketplace. I don't believe that, and we will be rebidding this next year, um, although I don't, uh, I don't necessarily believe costs will go down as they've, uh, over what has been bid this year. Ms. Causey, I'm also concerned that all of the, the other venues are high use by many organizations. It's very difficult for us to secure regularly scheduled meetings. Uh, so uh, waiting to, to take advantage of some of this, I, I think, puts us at a disadvantage in order to meet the professional development needs that we have. Okay. Is it possible if some of these other uh, companies get sorted out or purchased that you would be able to go back and get another lower cost? How would it, how would it be for you to, 
try and procure a lower cost vendor if one becomes available? Uh, yeah, I mean, if, uh, if we identify, uh, if we're not able to meet our needs with this RFP, we can come back to the board and, uh, and move to add a vendor if they meet all the original criteria and we're struggling uh, with the selection that we have. Okay, and I guess part of my thought is the cost in having a, a lower cost provider because we are spending a lot. Um, that was in one of my budget questions. So, um, okay, that's all the questions I have. Um, do I have a motion to approve item L3? Thank you, Ms. Joes. Do I have a second? Sorry. We've got a competition here. <laughs> Thank you, Lily. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. All in, is there any other discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. Motion carries unanimously, and that uh, brings us to our last item, item L8. Do I have a motion? Well, let's read. Let's do this one separately. This one is a little different. So, gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, item eight is about encroachment issues at Orms Elementary School. As I shared in the business uh, building committee meeting, we have a site project for expanding the parking lot that is approved by the board. It's a capital project that is under design. And what we found out uh, even before starting the design that there are several encroachment to our property. There were five encroachments and two of the folks when we sent the letter in 2017 uh, have removed their items that were on our site. Uh, this one particular uh, encroachment is larger than the other encroachments, and it is in the area where the stormwater management system is being planned. So we s sent the first letter in 2017, and we have followed that letter by several letters about the encroachments to be removed. They have, in turn, submitted a request to board that they be allowed to use that space and they'd be allowed to lease that space. As background information, there was a lease that existed in 1980, but that had a sunset provision, my understanding is, and that when the, when the property was sold in 2002, then those, that lease expired. Since then, there has not been any lease. If we don't uh, remove that encroachment, will be setting up a precedent and there are several other schools that have encroachment and we may have to go through the similar process. The cost for changing the design is anywhere from fifty to hundred thousand dollars which includes changing the design. It also includes removing some of the utilities underground and as a minimum it'll, it'll uh, change the completion of project time by one year. The need for making the change to the parking lot is urgent because the enrollment there is 403, which is 100 more than the SRC of the school. So we would like to start with the project as soon as we can. Our current schedule is to come to the board for the project approval in next month or so and we are targeting completion of that project before school opens in September. If there are any questions, uh, I would also like to add that you heard from the representative of the homeowner, and there were a couple of statements there that I would like to, clear, to, to give you some uh, estimate on the cost. The, uh, I believe it's an attorney that indicated that the cost is minimal and it is not minimal. The cost is quite a bit of making the change. And the other statement was that as a result of this design, 
there'll be more probability of flooding to the homeowner, and that statement is not accurate. Because when we do site design, part of the reason we do it is to take care of the stormwater within our site and prevent any water flowing to neighborhood properties. With that, if you have any questions, I'll, I'll definitely try to answer. Excuse me, do we want to make a motion first, Ms. Hen? Sure. I move to accept staff's recommendation um, of the denial of the request for the encroachment, to allow the encroachment. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Mr. Alton. Now discussion, Mr. Kuhn? So, just so I understand the description of what we're talking about, we were provided with some pictures and it just looks like a backyard with fence. And my question about the encroachment is, is, is it outside of the fence that we're talking about? Because these fences are contiguous. Or are both of those neighbors encroaching on our space? Both of those neighbors are encroaching on the space. One neighbor had just fence. The other neighbor has a deck attached to the swimming pool that's encroaching our property. Swimming pool itself is not encroaching the property, but there is a ticky bar of some kind or, or a deck of some ticky kind bar. that's okay. encroaching our property. Just so that I'm clear, is it, it's so that's the entire length of the yard all the way across. That's true. And, and the stormwater management that has been planned is, is right in that area. Is, is right there. So there's going to be a pond behind their houses. That's right. It's a it's, uh, pond, perhaps, is the wrong term. Okay. But it's a... It's a the dry basin that fills up when it gets right. wet. Mike, okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Ms. Joes, did you have a question? No, I'm good, thank you. Ms. Mack? Thank you, Mr. Dixon. I see on here that the Office of Law advises that BCPS does not have the authority to convey property to a private party for private interest. Does that convey mean sell? You'll have to ask the lawyer. Um, no, ma'am, that was not uh, the context. It wasn't just sell. It was provide to a private party for private interest, so an easement or a license. It sounds to me like the, the cost are already set costs to do this and to make any changes would be a significant cost. But in situations like this, have we ever considered selling the property that is currently rented to a property owner? BCPS doesn't sell the property, it's my understanding. We transfer the property to Baltimore County. And I'm looking at uh, Ms. Hoy. Under state law, the Board of Education does not have the authority to sell property. What, what happens is a process where the Board of Education would declare property to be surplus and then would go to Baltimore County. But, but the, you all do not have the authority under state law to sell any property that the Board owns outright. I'm going to recuse myself from this vote. I walk this property. The settlement pond that you mentioned is at least 300 yards away from these people's homes. Uh, I personally think it needs to be looked at. I read a letter that was sent from Baltimore County Public Schools to the family, and it talks about flooding in that letter. So I don't understand why on one end we say there's not going to be any flooding, but on the other end, a letter from Baltimore County Public Schools was sent to that home that talked about flooding as a result of the, the parking lot change. So I personally, as I said, I'm recusing myself. However, I think it needs to be re-examined is, is my opinion. Thank you. Mr. Dixit, would you like to answer the question related to well, the letter two. about flooding? Yeah, there, there are two questions in there. The, I don't know the settlement pond, but we have not started the site work. So I don't know what settlement pond. The, the pond or the structure for stormwater management has not been created yet. It is still under design. And the second part of the question was the water flooding into their property. 
that was not written in any of the letters that I have sent, and that's something that I do not know. The purpose of the site work design is to contain the water within our property. If we do not do the site plan the way it should be done, then we increase the probability of draining water into neighborhood property. Can I respond to that? Certainly, and then Ms. Jones has a point of order. When one recuses himself from a vote, they are not supposed to comment on the issue or ask questions. Mr. Nussbaum? Well, that's correct. If, if, uh, if Mr. McMillian had recused himself, then maybe he should have. Okay. You, you may not respond, Mr. McMillian. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Ms. Joes? Mr. Dixit, you said it's under design, so it's been graded and it's gone through the approval process for the detention pond. Um, I do want to point out a very key thing in Maryland or any other state or jurisdiction, you may flood your property to your heart's content. You cannot flood another person's property. So if they were indeed flooding, they wouldn't have got approval or permits from MDE that it has to go through. Um, since I do design stormwater ponds, what it's, it's doing is it's catching uh, flooded uh, water or rain events that are high is going to be caught by this detention pond. So it's not really flooding, but it's actually a detention pond to stop flooding. Thank you for clarifying. You're welcome. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Joes. Any other discussion? Ms. Rowe? So I just wanted to know, because I've seen some of these issues before, is we're doing what we're doing on the school property to contain the drainage from the school property. But in doing that, the way the property is graded now, is are their neighbors' properties draining onto school property, and will our setup cause them to retain their own drainage? All of that issues are considered during the design. Mm -hmm. And before we can build anything, uh, number one, the design is prepared by a licensed person, and it is reviewed by the permitting authority of Baltimore County. So everything is licensed, and we make sure that we do not create any issues for the neighbors. Okay, thank you. I'm, I'm sorry. Um, Rod, if, if you've seen a letter from the school system that contradicts what we're hearing today, I, can we postpone this to the next meeting and perhaps find it because it's concerning to me that we would have communicated and maybe way well before us that you know this kind of an idea I, i'm not suggesting that i'm the one who sent the letter no, no. <laughs> i believe so, there was a you know, excuse me members of the board i so, believe there was a separate letter sent from the office of law uh based upon um under, an understanding that if there were no changes to the plan because the you're putting in a parking lot then yes there would be flooding that was possible to the homeowner's property i believe that's what the engineers informed um, the the law office and i believe that is what was in the correspondence that's true so at the end of the day mr dixit what the school system is attempting to do in terms of building the parking lot and having a stormwater management pond yes, yes. is to abide by all county code yeah. in terms of the water flow from the board's property into any other area. Is that correct? That's correct. And there's been a design done by engineers? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Um, we have a motion and a second, so we're going to take the vote on that. If it failed, there could be a motion to suspend it, but um, we're going to... We're uh, going to take the vote. Um, all in favor of? Yep. We'll let Julie restate her motion. So I move to accept staff's um, recommendation to deny um, the request. All in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? Any abstained? Okay, if you can note that, Ms. Gover. Uh, the motion carries. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you very much, gentlemen.
The next item on the agenda is um, item M, the fiscal year 2021 capital budget supplement. And so for that, we also have Mr. Saris and Mr. Dixit. Uh, thank you, Madam Chair. The, uh, occasionally, uh, over the years, we do um, find uh, capital funds that were not originally planned when the budget was adopted uh, last May. And in this case, the uh, uh, Healthy School Facility Fund grant was awarded to Baltimore County Public Schools. Uh, and the Baltimore County government has provided matching funds, which are within their adopted budget already. The state funds were not, and so they're simply requesting uh, that the board formally appropriate uh, this grant award uh, so that we can uh, move forward with the uh, capital projects that are associated with the grant and which are uh, referenced in uh, on page two of the uh, budget supplement form. Thank you, Mr. Saris. Do I have a motion to approve the fiscal year 2021 capital Moved. budget supplement as presented? Okay. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Rowe. And uh, second is Ms. Hen. Um, any discussion, Ms. Rowe? So I just want to say briefly that I am absolutely overjoyed to see the funding in place for temporary air conditioning solutions for the remaining schools in our county that do not have air conditioning solutions. And I would like to thank uh, now the Speaker of the Senate, Bill Ferguson, for helping to put this through. And our uh, state IAC and other uh, state officials who have approved this funding. And I would also like to thank Comptroller Peter Franco, who's helped for years to advocate for air conditioning in schools in spite of parents being called plants at Board of Public Works meetings and political theater. Ms. Scott. Great, yes, and um, to that end, I'd like to know specifically um, how that works in reference to Camp Field um, Early Learning Center. That's one of the schools where there was heating and air conditioning um, issues that were going on, and I wanted to see, I understand there was something being put there called vertical temporary heating units. And I wanted to see if I could get some clarification um, just about what those are, um, how long they last, and how that differs from like a air conditioning unit that's in a window. I, <clears throat> I don't have the specific uh, design uh, answers that you are asking, mm -hmm. but in general, vertical <clears throat> package units are self-contained units that do not require a central chiller that have the air conditioning piece within that unit and they are extremely efficient not as efficient as a central chilling plant but the advantage is that we can we can quickly install it without making any major changes to the building and we are actively designing that uh, we hope to complete the design and um, bring contract awards for your approval very soon in near future. Okay. So, so what timeline would that look like, I guess, for Camp Field? Um, would that be by, like, the summer or? We'll try to do that. There are so many unknowns at this point that it will be, um, be wrong for me to give you an exact date. But the target date is we are trying to complete it as soon as we can. Okay. Yeah. All right. Thank you. Other board member comments or questions? I just also, uh, do you have the names of the schools? Yes, the names read? of schools for air conditioning are Bedford Elementary Schools, Camp Field, uh, Early Learning Center, Catonsville Alternative School, Delaney High School, part of the Eastern Technical High School, Lansdowne High School, 
and part of the Western technology. Great, thank you. There is one more project which is for boiler replacement and that's at Hampton Elementary School. Okay, thank you. Um, I also am thrilled uh, with this supplement and uh, it's been a long road for a lot of our community members and there's been a lot of support throughout the county and I just appreciate uh, the work of everyone to yeah. bring us to this point. It's desperately needed for equity for our students, so I'm thrilled. Any other comments or questions? All in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? The motion carries unanimously. Um, at this time, since we have two other significant uh, agenda items, we are going to take just a five minute recess and then we will be uh, right back to continue the work of the board. Thank you.
Oh, right under the vent. Uh, I now reconvene the Board of Education meeting of Tuesday, February 11th. We are now on item N, new business, report on the Pleasant Plains Elementary Capacity Relief Boundary recommendation. And for that, we have Dr. Wheatley Phillips and Mr. Cropper and Ms. Byers. Good evening. Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chair Hen. Superintendent Williams and members of the board. Tonight we bring forth as a recommendation the option that was selected by the study committee that convened for the Pleasant Plains boundary study process. This recommendation was developed as a result of several months of planning and community engagement wherein members of the committee utilized the data that served to inform the process. Mr. Matt Cropper, the consultant who facilitated the process, is an experienced professional having worked in communities across the country and with BCPS for over 10 years. In addition to collaborating with Mr. Cropper, this process included working closely with school leaders, several offices within BCPS, and in addition to the Baltimore County planning team. Mr. Cropper will lead the presentation, after which Ms. Byers will share with you the next steps. Thank you, Dr. Wheatley Phillip, Chair Causey, members of the board, Dr. Williams, thank you for the opportunity to speak to you. I'm here to present the recommendation on behalf of the committee who was working on the Pleasant Plains Boundary Study process. Um, I am Matthew Cropper, uh, president of Cropper GIS Consulting. I have done over a dozen uh, boundary change uh, study processes for Baltimore County Public Schools, in addition to multiples uh, across the United States. Um, before I get into the process, I'd just like to um, talk to the Baltimore County's process about uh, as they go about looking at boundary changes. And um, when I work with other school districts across the country, I always use Baltimore County as an example or as a model of what a good process is. Um, this district has a very f solid foundation in establishing objectives and uh, the rules. Uh, which are a critical and a starting point before you get into a boundary change process, um, their process of putting together committees, and then most importantly, their process of, um, of enabling transparency and openness in the process to allow public members to follow what's happening, to participate and provide input, um, all the way to the extent of uh, Baltimore County having staff there to live stream all the meetings which are recorded and uh, can be viewed out on uh, on the, the same evening as the meeting is going on. I just applaud the county and, and uh, the, the efforts that they go to reach out to the constituents of the county and make sure that everybody is informed and follows, um, follows the process and has a voice and is able to participate from the very beginning. So um, with that said, uh, we'll talk a little bit about this process uh, for Pleasant Plains. Um, as you can see, here's the meeting calendar that we were working with. Um, we had six total meetings with this committee. Um, we also had a public information session uh, uh, sort of halfway, a little bit further than halfway through the process where the committee went to the public and, and, and uh, shared the maps that, are being, that were being considered at that time, solicited uh, in, input from them, had conversations around the maps, and then there was a survey that accompanied that to get input. Um, all of these meetings are open to the public, like I said, they're all live streamed, and all the materials that were shared with the committee members are, are, are available online uh, that, that, that evening, and so any member of the public can go online and print off and download and, uh, and look and evaluate all the same materials that any committee member can. So, um, so it's a very comprehensive process and going about um, the what comes to the recommendation that we're sharing with you tonight. So why is there a need for a boundary study in this particular uh, case? Um, as of September 30th, 2019, Pleasant Plains Elementary was uh, significantly overcrowded. They, they are significantly overcrowded. They're at about 125% utilization, uh, which is uh, um, far greater than the other schools in the study area that we were looking at. Um, enrollment is anticipated to increase in this particular school, and so um, there is an immediate need, an immediate need to provide capacity relief to this school. Um, the, the 
a lot of the questions are, what about other methods? Is there other ways to help pr provide capacity relief to this school? Well, the answer to that is that the district has already fully exhausted other measures to try to provide capacity relief to Pleasant Plains Elementary School. You can see on this slide, it shows you the different strategies that are used to try to provide relief to schools from the most sim simple and um, least costly to the most complex and, and, and most cost costly uh, options. Um, the, at the bottom, the very first thing that they were looking at was trying to look at space use recommendations, um, maybe taking away the music room and the art room or whatever the special use rooms that may be set aside for special instruction. Those have been re reclaimed as general classroom spaces. So they used uh, all of the spaces within the building that they could possibly use for general education to help accommodate the, the, the population enrollment of that school. Um, they've also put portable units out on the property. There are eight uh, mobile uh, uh, learning cottages on site that are to help uh, give some additional relief to the school, but there is no additional avail available space uh, to put any more of those on this property. Um, I think that I have heard that they were, the, the next step is to try to, pu is to put these out on the bus loop, which is basically, uh, is certainly a challenge in, in uh, can be an issue in itself. Um, the annexation of grade levels is, is something that is, a, is something that districts sometimes use, but that's something that is just not, not viable in this particular uh, case and uh, trying to keep students um, of all grade levels in the, in the building that live in this community going to the same school. Um, and so re the redistricting and boundary changes is really where we are at and the only option at this point th to provide immediate relief to Pleasant Plains Elementary School. Um, and it should be noted that this is not really seen as a long-term end-all fix for this region. Um, this area is overcrowded and there, the committee acknowledges that there is definitely an evident need for more capacity in this area to provide additional relief. So this is not seen as a long-term solution, but is seen as, seen as a solution to give Pleasant Plains the immediate capacity relief, which is, uh, which is really with the forefront of the issue that this committee was facing. Um, when considering schools that could provide capacity relief to Pleasant Plains, the district looked at area, the schools in the area. Um, Hampton Elementary and Halstead Element Academy were the, the two schools that were identified that could potentially provide some capacity relief to Pleasant Plains. These, these schools are adjacent to the school. Um, and looking beyond that, there are just very few to no schools adjacent. If you look at another outer ring of this study area that have available capacity to provide relief to Pleasant Plains Elementary School. Um, you can see this uh, one of the one of the questions from the public that was was why is the study area so small? Why did, didn't you extend it to a larger, greater community to try to help solve this uh, challenge? And as you can see, the utilization rates of the schools that uh, that are not part of the study are well over 100 percent as well. And um, and there's just there's just not a, any other uh, building next door that has a lot of available space that can be added to this to the study area to provide capacity <coughs> relief. Um, Cromwell Valley is is in the middle of the study area and it was not part of this uh, boundary study process and the reason behind that is that Cromwell Valley went through a boundary change process in 2016 uh, where a boundary was established for Cromwell Valley uh, to make it entirely walkable for students who live Im immediately around Cromwell Valley that did provide some capacity relief to Hampton Elementary at that time when that process occurred um, and if you look on paper, you can see Cromwell Valley looks like it does have some capacity still available. But Cromwell Valley is in the process of, of uh, building out uh, their a magnet program so that as every year more students are enrolling in that school and so that that students around the entire region in this area can participate in that uh, in that program at Cromwell Valley. And so um, that's really why Cromwell Valley wasn't part of this. They have limited space available to help provide relief and then also it would compromise the plans of the um, of how that program is, is anticipated to build out and uh, the, the plans for that particular building and um, the program there. Um, another thing to note is that Oakley Elementary did participate and receive some capacity relief via boundary study that became effective in 2018-19 on this, uh, looking at this chart. Um, 
but uh, but yes, and so that's that's kind of a, a background on the study area and why didn't we go beyond and uh, extend beyond the study area that we were working with. So the objective of, of this committee's work was to um, was to provide capacity relief to Pleasant Plains Elementary, like I had mentioned. That's the key focus of the committee, to give them immediate relief. To try to support diversity among schools that reflect the community and the school system. And then to try to create viable and successful boundaries to effectively utilize capacity of adjacent schools and schools in this area. Try to make things equitable, if at all possible. The primary considerations, um, and this is referring to Rule 1280, was to make efficient use of capacity in the affected schools um, and to maintain or increase the diversity of the schools. So the committee was looking at statistics to help support this and demographic data and also utilization and estimated enrollment. Other things that the committee um, was to consider, as, as it states in Rule 1280, are uh, to maintain the continuity of neighborhoods, um, to be mindful of the impact of transportation and pedestrian patterns on students, um, minimize the number of times any inv individual students are reassigned, so being mindful of any ch children who have been reassigned recently, and uh, that doesn't apply in this particular uh, in, in any case, what we are working with here. Um, be mindful of long-term enrollment, capacity trends, and uh, uh, future capital plans. And so we did share projected enrollment information, um, future uh, capital plans, and um, capacity trends with the committee. Anytime the committee had requested information as it relates to uh, anything that supports the rules and their work was provided to them at, uh, at it, throughout the process. Location of feeder school boundaries and continuity of feeder patterns. So we're not look. We weren't looking at making any changes to middle school or high school, but uh, we were analyzing the impact on how schools are feeding from elementary to middle and middle to high school currently, and then also for any option that they were looking at. Um, the next one is one that was really more pertains to high schools. It doesn't really. Uh, pertain to the elementary process that we were working with. Additional things to consider that the committee was looking at was trying to use geographic features, uh, major roads, highways, uh, creeks, other um, man-made or, uh, or natural geographic features which align with best practices in the industry. Talking about the committee and the composition of the committee, it was a, a, a well-rounded group uh, fr from the study area. There were three principals who sat on this committee, um, three teacher and staff representatives were on the committee, and there were six parents, two parents from each school sat on the committee and as they evaluated options for this, for this process. We also had one area educational advisory council representative who gave us, uh, who gave us uh, uh, the benefit of uh, their knowledge in this area sitting on the committee. This committee met seven times between September to, to, through December and they worked uh, really did a good job. I know that it was a tough it was a tough process because it was um, you know you they leave they leave this recommendation knowing that they're not be able to solve all of the challenges in the area. So that kind of leaves um, uh, a little bit of heartburn for the committee as they make a recommendation knowing that they can't solve all of the all the issues that exist, but they did their best to provide relief and adhere to the objectives uh, that were that were given to them. They they reviewed and agreed upon the planning blocks, the small building blocks for boundary changes that we worked with uh, and, and drafted for them, and so they gave us input on that. And uh, multiple options were considered and discussed and developed through the course of this process. Um, uh, like I said, all the materials were available online on the BCPS webpage designed specifically for this study. Um, emails were received from the public's public and those were shared with the committee members and also posted online. We have an interactive map that any member of the public and committee and myself as well can zoom in on any area and you really see what's on the ground as opposed to just looking at a map with, with roads and boundaries. You could see the aerial imagery and see actually what the area looks like and how dense is the housing versus one area versus another and the type of housing and things like that. So um, a lot of materials that they had in, at their hands to fully inform them on this process. The public was was uh, very active and involved in this process, and they continue to be. Um, they were. We had people at all the meetings observing. Um, they were uh, very uh, 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 passionate about their thoughts um, as it relates to the options that were being considered. One of the things that the public members, one of their concerns that the 
at the, during the process was that we were working with September 2018-19 data. Um, and we had to do that because if you look at how the, the process started, it started in early September. So we were starting with the data that we had available. Um, they were concerned that that data was outdated and they, were, they had uh, uh, concerns that we weren't working with the most recent information. So to address that concern, we, we updated our data um, throughout in the midpoint of the process when that information was available, we updated all the statistics and, and, and uh, information with current enrollment as of September 2019-20. Um, it's best to work with that September, or that, that official enrollment date, because then you can compare um, points in time and it's, it's always good to start to have your basis of data be at the same point time so you for longitudinal analysis and many other reasons um, but the public was uh, was informed at the very beginning before the process began the public was uh, informed of what was coming up um, the, the the district went through efforts to to send out letters and uh, notifying families about this, that this was happening and how they can participate. Uh, public attended all the meetings as observers and they, they, were, they were there at every meeting. Um, and like I said, there were live streams of the meetings were, were made available to the public. So if they couldn't come to the meeting, they could watch it from their home um, or they're, they're saved and recorded. So anybody can go back and look at, um, look at prior meetings. And like I said, all the materials were available online, so any member of the public can have their own binder, just like any committee member had. They did provide emails. We did receive a lot of uh, um, information and, and feedback from them through the course of the study, which we shared with the with the committee. Um, and then the public information session was the was the key time where the committee. Uh, they started off looking at maps, developing as many maps as they can to try to solve the problem. Um, and then they narrowed down to a series of maps to share with the public. And that's when they took those to the public, invited the public to come out and standing around the maps and giving, having conversations with members of the public. And then there was a survey that accompanied that. We had 283 uh, unique respondents to the survey, which given the, the, the scale of the study area, that's a pretty good uh, turnout, pretty good input that was received. Um, and it was, that survey was provided provided in English and in Spanish. Committee considered five total options through the course of this study. Um, there was one alternative option at the last, uh, last meeting to, um, to, to see if there was an, an additional variation of an option that they could consider, and I'll share that with you here in a minute. Um, they reviewed and discussed all the materials and uh, worked in small groups and marked up maps. Um, they, they recognized that draft option B satisfied the most boundary study considerations. So option B, although it's not perfect and not a good uh, long, viable long-term solution, it's the best solution to give, uh, to adhere to the objectives and uh, really to do, to fully uh, do the job that they were tasked to do. Um, so uh, they, they considered all information from all sources, from the public and uh, as well as careful and, and uh, thoughtful study of the materials. Just to give you a little background on the boundaries, here are the current boundaries. So you can see the green uh, boundary on the top is the Hampton uh, current boundary. The purple area is the Pleasant Plains boundary and the, the orange one below that is the Halstead boundary. Um, like I said, Pleasant Plains is 125% utilized in this, uh, uh, under this current configuration, um, Hampton has is utilized 86% uh, utilized, and then Halst Halstead is 98% utilized. Looking at option A was one of the options that did not uh, was not the recommendation. This option uh, brought Pleasant Plains to 101 percent, but Hampton went up to 103 percent. So this is one I, I think that the committee you can see that the 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 green area gets larger and the the purple area gets smaller. Um, this this option also took Halstead Academy to 102 percent. So I think the committee felt like the, this option wasn't part of the recommendation because they felt like um, it was. Um, uh, moving more students into Halstead and maybe too many into Hampton potentially, um, although it's still Pleasant Plains is still at 101 percent utilized. This is option B and this is the recommendation and this option does not impact Halstead so it reduces the number of students that are impacted um, and, and all the options that they were considered. Um, Hampton is at 101 percent. 
Pleasant Plains is at 106% in the recommendation. So they go from 125 to 106. Again, it's not bringing everybody into, uh, into the green here, but it's giving relief. Um, Hampton is at 101% utilization in this, in this particular option. Um, and there has been uh, the concerns from the from the public about future housing developments and things like that. Uh, they're they're valid concerns. There are there are residential housing units being uh, that are planned in in this region. And um, one thing to note that the 600 units that have been spoken about, um, I'd say 95% of those are uh, in two developments that are that are planned, multi-family developments that are planned in the area, which they're um, not the type of developments that typically typically yield students. A lot of the, the units in there are um, like studios and single uh, one bedrooms. And um, we don't see a whole lot of students coming out of the housing developments that, that are being planned in the area that, that are bringing the big numbers in to the table, that's 600 units. I know that sounds scary, but when you think 600 units, this isn't a single family uh, uh, development that has a, a lot of uh, um, homes where a lot of children come into them. They are more of the multi-family st style, multi-level uh, uh, apartment complexes and things like that that don't typically yield many students. Um, and and another thing to note with the, the construction and the and the the ongoing construction is something we always see schools do and communities do is they add on to the current enrollment, a new construction. They just add that on to, the, to, to what they think the enrollment's gonna be of a building. But other things you have to factor, which the enrollment projections that the district does, factors in different things in addition to new construction. They factor in aging and empty nesting of communities. And so it's, um, as, as new construction's coming online and gonna be adding students to this, to this community, there are also um, communities and households that are aging and children are moving into middle and high school and fewer elementary kids are coming out of other uh, parts of the parts of the area so that that should be noted this is the B1 uh, uh, option that they were looking at and I you can see I circled the area that they were considering to um, remain in Pleasant Plains and this is one that planning block 231 that was that the that was considered um, this would put Hampton at 98 percent and uh, Pleasant Plains would be 110 percent utilized the committee um, although they put this on the table for a vote it was not something that they that they just determined was uh, the recommendation for for this study and this is the option C, and this is one that had uh, Pleasant Plains at 107 percent, uh, Hampton at 102, and Halstead at 97. And I think this option was one that um, moved more students than some of the other options and moved students in, in, into Halstead. Um, so there was a, a little more movement in this option than, than, than the recommendation that uh, they bring forward to you. So like I said, the committee has, is recommending option B. Um, we had uh, the, the voting members present. Uh, option B received five votes. Option C received three votes. And uh, the committee as a whole felt that the recommended option did meet, best meet the boundary study objectives. And this is the map that shows you the recommendation if it, if it were approved as it, as it is recommended. Information, uh, supporting information here that shows you the enrollment utilization and the utilization of the buildings and what those would look like. Um, and I've, I think I've covered those pretty uh, okay in previous slides. We can always go back if you want to see any more detail in these slides. Um, no real impact, uh, a substantial impact in the percent minority. Um, Hampton's percent minority uh, does draw closer to the average of the study area. Um, as well as the percent ELL and farms, um, they they draw they 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 draw a little bit closer to the average. Although there weren't there aren't substantial strides to make things uh, per balanced in this area, which isn't part of uh, the task. It's really trying to see if you can improve the diversity uh, while while accomplishing the other objectives. That's really the 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 what the committee was looking at here. 100 students are anticipated to be impacted as part of this process, which are the students that would be, uh, and the, as the recommendation has, would be moved from Pleasant Plains to Hampton, as I have indicated on the maps and the committee's recommendation.
feeder patterns. This is, shows you the percentage of, uh, of schools that feed from elementary to middle school. Um, feeder patterns were um, cleaned up in, in as it, for, as it relates to Pleasant Plains. Pleasant Plains has a couple of small splits currently. This puts Pleasant Plains 100% in, entirely into Lock Raven. Hampton does gain an additional split, uh, primarily with the, uh, I think it's planning block 231, that um, that being added to Hampton um, creates an additional split because of just the nature of the middle school zones and how they travel through that area. Um, no students are anticipated to be uh, uh, moved out of a walkable situation. So any student who can walk to school, they remain in their walk zones. And so there was no impact on walkability uh, as it relates to the recommendation. And so there are two steps left in the process. The board will hold its board hearing on February 23rd at Lock Raven High School in the auditorium. And then the decision will be made Tuesday, March 10th during the Board of Education meeting. Thank you. Board members, are there questions or comments? Ms. Rowe? And then Mr. McMillian. So I just want to say I watched every single live stream for this. And I think that boundary studies are one of the things that we do best in this school system. Every single time I've seen them happen in the last four years, I've watched every single live stream of every single boundary study. And even when difficult discussions take place, they have excellent facilitation. And in this one, I, I want to commend you on the job that you did facilitating the conversations and the work of the study because it's very difficult to do these boundary studies, particularly with the diversity of communities that we have and trying to bring different communities together to come into agreement on something so that the school system doesn't just have to make unilateral decisions on something that's very important to the community. And I really think that the school system and yourself did a fantastic job facilitating this boundary study. And I think that um, every time we just allow the community's voice to be heard and come up with the recommendation. I do have a few questions um, that I'll run through quickly um, because we've heard some people asking questions about Cromwell Valley and why that wasn't um, considered. So Cromwell Valley is a magnet school with a limited zone for walkers that was meant to move approximately 100 students out of Hampton into the, CV, um, the Cromwell um, zone, is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay, and the degree to which Cromwell is under capacity is a result of being held off the magnet application for several years to create the capacity needed to create space for those 100 seats, is that correct? That is correct. And as a result of adding the Walker Zone, Cromwell will be required to have two pre-K classes that it was not required to have as a zone-free magnet school, and those pre-K classes will be starting next year. Is that correct? I will defer to Ms. Byers because... I will have to get that to you. Just to be certain. Yes. I believe I actually saw it like in a yes. weekly update or something, but okay. But there's two. There's, right, so there's two pre-K classes, but they're not starting till next year. We will confirm. Okay. Um, next year, or whenever, when the pre-cart classes are added, the, va the vacancy in the fourth and fifth grade, created by the years of not being on the magnet application, will have the school at capacity. Is that correct? So basically what I'm asking is once the pre-K is added, and once the vacancy created by being off the magnet application is matriculated out, the school will be at capacity? We expect that once the school, the magnet program has filled for each grade level, um, and we do have pre-K, the school should be at capacity. Okay. And is it true that Cromwell property cannot accommodate even one trailer because of the topography of the property? There are specific site restrictions that would limit that. The, the biggest concern we have is the safety of children, and so there are site limitations because we want to ensure that all children are safe. Okay. And is it true that... Um, I don't think I need that one. I'm finished, thank you. Thank you. Mr. McMillian? I just have a couple of real quick questions. 
the 616 homes that are mentioned, Councilman Koch mentioned them, and you referenced that houses. Those are houses where they've, the permits have already been issued. Their houses going to be built in the Hampton community. Is that correct? They are uh, multifamily units, yes, sir. They would, there wouldn't be houses. They'd be more uh, uh, multifamily de developments. I, and I don't know if all of them are platted and approved. I, but, um, but I would say um, that certainly that, that 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 is an accurate statement. That those do exist and that they are there. Um, yes, sir. Okay, and it and it was referenced that 25 children, elementary age children, will come out of those six, 616 homes. We have a formula that we can look at a development and gauge elementary school, middle schools, and high school students. Correct. We have pro we work with Sage Partners to establish a projection methodology that will help us estimate, given a particular development, what the yield would be. So it tells us based on the projection numbers, the number of students at the elementary level, the middle school level, as well as the high school level. Do you know what that, that f I've actually seen it, and I can't reference it right, right away, but there's a number that is used as a mul multiplier based upon the number of homes. So do you know what the multiplier is for elementary schools? I do not. I would have to ask the team for that information. So we certainly can provide that information in a weekly update. Okay. I was curious if it matches, you know, if it equals the 25 kids. Because as you said, that sounds very, very low. And I understand the old nester and that, and that kind of thing and how things balance out. Mm, sure. But 25 children for 660 homes doesn't sound, the elementary age children doesn't sound like very much to me. Mm -hmm. and. To the Cromwell Valley situation where kids can walk to Cromwell Valley. So the walkers are automatically in that magnet program. Is that correct? No. So, so they don't have to apply, they're accepted in, and then anybody that outside of that walk to area has to apply to for acceptance into that program. Is that correct? Yes, but it's a lottery. Uh, and there's no, there's no test, is there? It's a lottery. It's an application process, and they submit their application, and then that if is, they're selected, then they go in. That is correct. Okay, thank you. Miss mm -hmm. Hen, and then Miss Mack. Thank you. So I just want to begin by seconding Miss Rose's comments that the boundary study process is truly exemplary. And when I think of processes that this system does unusually well, um, as a model for other school systems, this is at the top of the list. So I want to thank you all for your efforts in this. It's truly outstanding. And also when I think of transparency and processes involving the community, again, this is at the top of the list. So really well done and, and thank you very much. Um, that said, I have a few, few questions um, for clarification, um, probably for you, Mr. Cropper. Hmm. Um, my first question is, you mentioned one of the factors of, for consideration of the committee was capacity trends. Mm -hmm. And I'm curious, if, does that include development trends when you speak to capacity? We and did, what information is provided to the committee in terms of development trends? We did to, uh, provide maps that showed the location of the developments and the number of units that are being planned, as well as the number of students that are anticipated to come out of those developments. So that was part of the conversation and some and information that we the committee did have as they were evaluating the, the different options. So they were aware of those developments and uh, the number of units and the number of students that are expected to come out of them. Okay, and I imagine those were sourced from <coughs> county government, any, you're using recent data. I know that some community members have expressed concerns about recency of data and <coughs> with, re re with regards to enrollment projections, and you addressed that. Thank you very much for addressing sure. that. But in sure. terms of working with the most recent information regarding new developments, um, community members have expressed concern that, and of course they know their neighborhoods the best, right? right? They're right. the first to see a new development going up. So is that information that you were privy to and is that information that was shared with the committee? Um, the development information was something that was um, was the, the most recent information that we had available. Um, the pupil yield information is something that, that we were referencing, the most recent pupil yield study that was um, that was done for the district. Um, and, it, and the pupil yield rates that were applied or that were, that were used to generate those yields do, do 
our pupil yield rates, not for the entire county, but for uh, they're, they're pertinent to the area that the study was in. And so um, the, the way those pupil yield rates uh, vary, they, they were done, they're done by election district. And so there are different yield rates in different parts of the county. And some counties yield a lot more students out of multifamily than others. Um, but um, in this particular area, do the sampling of multifamily developments um, um, doesn't indicate as many students as what one may think when you when you see a 600 units on on paper, um, which isn't surprising to me from my experience in seeing how other multifamily developments are yielding students. They typically don't yield large numbers, especially the the multi-story uh, um, units with smaller uh, square footage and higher rents, things like that. They're really not ideal for um, for lots of families to move into. Sure, and that makes sense. Um, a related concern that we've heard from the community is that this particular area, um, the enrollments have exceeded projections, um, particularly at the schools that were included in this boundary study. Um, and several um, suggestions have been made to explain why. Um, I'm not sure that those have been backed by actual data or whether they're um, suggestions maybe due to a transient more transient population in the area there there are various causes that that have been tossed out is that something you looked at in terms of the accuracy of previous enrollment and recent enrollment projections that was a concern that we heard from uh, members of the public and also members of the committee had you know some concerns that the trends of the projected enrollment that was on paper uh, weren't panning out and and from looking at actual enrollments um, and we acknowledged that and and you know basically just sharing everything that we had that we could with them to just make sure they were fully informed and understand everything I think that when it was all said and done what was what's noted is that enrollment in all three of these schools was was projected to go up and so um, if if one was trending down and another one was trending up then it may be it may have lended to a different conversation but the the nature of it is that all three schools in the study area are projected to increase and um, and so it wasn't going no school was going to get any relief through demographic dynamics over time as the projections in indicated sure thank you and I just have a, a few more quick questions um, one of my concerns early on there there was a lot of interest obviously as I'm sure you've realized within the community and interest in participating in the committee in particular and one of the concerns was the size of the committee with I believe you said 11 members is that correct 13 John saying 13 yes, I think it was it's 13. Thank you. Uh -huh. With 13 members, yeah. and I believe there were eight votes for the final option. Is that correct? Right. Yes, but the, the three of the principals are not allowed, allowed non-voting members. And so um, 10 total uh, members on the committee are eligible to vote. And eight votes. Can you speak to the distribution of those votes? Again, I don't want to disturb the confidentiality of those votes, of course, but I want to eliminate any concerns, and I had some concerns about the representation of those votes in terms of the schools represented and those, the members that are representing the schools impacted by the study. And well, the, the way the voting the process works with um, with the active with the active vote, um, they we know how many votes were tallied for each option that make up the recommendation but we don't know which members voted for which option so um so we're uncertain as to which members uh voted for the recommendation and versus those that voted for option c it, it's an anonymous uh voting process in terms of those that voiced strong opinions toward can was there um did anyone voice strong favoritism toward one or the other in terms of school representation? Can you speak to that? Um, you know, I think that the committee really worked cohesively. I didn't really see a divide among the committee. And uh, sometimes when we work with committees, you'll see uh, some, one group really supporting one direction of the option development, another one's supporting another one. I, f I felt like uh, when the committee got together and worked, they worked as a team, as, as one um, a large unit. And uh, so I, I don't, I, I, from what I gathered, it was um, the opposition for uh, the recommendation is 
more related to the concern of over of overcrowding Hampton Elementary. Um, but then we also have you know the 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 Pleasant Plains community was pleading to give them capacity relief because they they acknowledged that they need relief and then Halstead community was um, had concerns about getting too over adding too many students to Halstead because that that community has um, a higher percentage of um, of, of minority and ELL and um, and that um, that community was just concerned about ha ha having too many students in their school and further overcrowding their school, just like Hampton had uh, similar similar concerns from both communities. So, if if the board does approve the recommendation of of the committee of option B, which considerations were not satisfied by this option? You mentioned that not all could be, and. Aside from the obvious that you know capacity was not perfectly balanced, which that's not the the expectation, of course. But um, I would say that um, option the the recommendation. So the question is, what what uh, what do what we leave on the table? What do we leave on the table with option with option B? B? I think with option B, um, you provide as much capacity relief as Pleasant Plains as you can, um, and. Of, of all the options, I think option B, uh, as the committee recommended, is, is the best option. Um, but I think the limitations are is just the available space in the entire area. And uh, that's really the, the overall limitation to, to this. And I don't know if any option can meet that or uh, uh, resolve that limitation. Is just the, the, the lack of available seats in the area to accommodate all the students in this area. Okay. And last question, and I know Ms. Mack's been waiting patiently. You you mentioned that the aging of the neighborhoods kind of offsets the growth that we've been talking about. Um, but a trend that we've seen in, in this area, and this is some borders my home territory, so I'm familiar with this, um, is that there's turnover in the neighborhoods as younger families move in, and that's partially why we see the adjacent schools so overcrowded is because of that turnover of the neighborhoods, younger families with children moving in and, of course, enrolling in our schools. Can you speak to that and how that factored into your analysis? That's just a, it's just a, a dynamic of, um, of housing and demographics in any, in any area. And um, in, in this area, there are communities that are at different cycles of home, of, of the home turnover process. And so there are um, a lot more younger families um, in the southern part of the study area in Pleasant Plains and in Halstead um, and then up is looking up into the Hampton area there are um, a lot there's a lot more higher concentration of single family housing um, and some of that housing is aging and empty nesting and then some of it is already beyond that point where once you get past the empty nesting phase younger families, start, they, the home turns over and younger families move in. And so uh, talking with the Hampton community members uh, throughout the process, they were saying that that's, ex that's occurring in the communities right around Hampton Elementary, particularly the community right around the school is really revitalized I wouldn't say revitalizing, but it's turning over and more younger families are moving in. And so I, I don't want to generalize the, the Hampton community in saying that it's all empty nesting, um, but in, I think there's a combination of different trends that are occurring. It's just important to note when you look at enrollment of a school that you can't just add new construction to the, to the formula. You have to also factor that aging and empty nesting and existing home turnover that, that's that's happening in this area. Okay. Thank you. Ms. Mack. Mr. Cropper, I also rec rec recognize you from four schools that you did in District 1. I was wondering when you sat down, I was like, why do you look so familiar? But I attended those and I agree with my colleagues that they, the boundary studies I attended were very well run, so thank you. Um, one of the reasons given to board members a question that was asked for not using Cromwell Valley is the full reinstitution of the magnet program. We recently had a discussion in a committee meeting that not all of our specialty programs are filled to capacity. And I, I'll, Ms. Byers, I guess I'll address this to you. Do you have any concerns that we're holding back these seats at Cromwell Valley and they will in fact not be used? 
Not at all, um, because we're phasing in the seats as we go since we um, transitioned it. So no, I'm not concerned. Okay, thank you. And then my other question, I know this boundary study is focused on giving relief to Pleasant Plains, but we have had a lot of parents from um, Hampton come and provide pictures of very crowded hallways, um, sharing their fears that they're going to be now forced to put a relocatable back on their properties. When we go through this process, and I guess Dr. Wheatley Phillips, this is a question for you, mm -hmm. are, do we have a strategy for caring for those concerns should option B be the option that's selected? Because you can't ignore um, the very, very compelling testimonies that parents gave and the picture of the hallway, you know, is like seared in my brain and it didn't even include, I think, fifth graders. Right. So how, how are we going to address those concerns if indeed this is the option chosen? I think we'll continue to work with the community superintendent's office as well as the office of facilities. Um, I, well, I have to be honest that we never at, in beginning this particular study, um, we were very clear that this is a short term solution. And so therefore, when parents at Hampton share that they have fears about their school becoming overcrowded, on the other side of that coin, we have parents at Pleasant Plains that came here begging, pleading us as well, because they were already in that situation. Um, and when you think about the safety of children, if the next option for us at Pleasant Plains is to put a relocatable in a parking lot, then that really speaks to safety for children. So we'll continue to work with the community superintendent's office. We'll work with facilities planning to really provide the best plan forward, to create the best plan and implement that plan. But this truly was a short-term solution, and we have to think about the needs of all the children across BCPS. And right now, for us as a system, the, 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 the fears, the concerns of the parents and the children of Pleasant Plains, they're ringing loud as well. Thank you. Mr. Offerman, Mr. Yes, Chair. I was wondering if we had a prediction for Pleasant Plains enrollment next year if nothing was done at the end of this year. I don't have that. It's okay if you don't. It's fine. I, you, if you could just get that to I me, I'd appreciate it. Thank you. Mr. Kuhn. Thank you. Um, I've lived through uh, one of these, so I, I know how much work they are and how how much input goes into it. So I know it's not an easy job, so thank you for doing it. Um, I live not far from this area. I, I understand um, the growth that's occurring in the central area in all the elementary schools. And um, one of the things that I'm concerned about is I he keep hearing this is a short-term solution. Have we defined what short term actually means? I mean, are we are we going to do this for two years and then two years is up and it goes back? What what are, what are we doing here? I think given the limited resources that we have, um, Mr. Cropper shared the, the strategy relief chart that we utilize in terms of starting from um, strategies that provide the least impact to those that are within our control. Um, I think that this particular step where we are in terms of the boundary process is the last thing that internally we as BCPS could do. So short term is the best solution we can provide at this time in terms of looking at the boundary study process. Outside of this, we will have to look at and rely on support from the county in terms of the region and providing relief within the region. This is the best that we could do internally to take care of all children. Okay, so what you just described is you've optimized the situation at hand, right? That is and correct. and I appreciate that because you know resources are limited, um, and I know that this wasn't part of the discussion, um, but the Bicota Senior Center used to be a school, and it's if you if you look at the location on the map, and you see Pleasant Plains and you see Hampton, the distances that it would take to go to, from Pleasance Plain to Bicota, which used to be a school, um, could make it, very well make it an option. Um, and I know that the county manages that as a senior center at this point in time. Uh, and I know that we are in dire need of some space, even not trying to put an entire school there, if maybe a grade or two had to be relocated. How would we entertain ideas like that so that we're not just passing the, 
the overcrowded problem around. I mean, 600 plus units, that's gonna have some yield. We know that the area is growing. There's lots and lots of building in the Towson area. So I'm just curious is how do we think about that and how could we consider it going forward? Because like I said, and now for the third time, it was a school at one point in time. Um, and I haven't been, to be honest with you, I haven't been inside it. Um, I know there are fields right in front of it, and, um, and I've been inside the gym. Uh, but beyond that, uh, I, I have no idea as to what the classrooms look like or what, what the space is used for. But when I'm thinking about this, and I don't, you know, I, I know we were using the footprint we have, right? And this is slightly outside of that, even though it's a county building. It may fit our needs in a short-term type of a situation. And that's why I go back to, we're talking about short-term. That's why I said, how are we defining that, right? This could be swing space, uh, you know, while we're trying to do other capital projects. But I just wanted to throw that out there because I know there's a lot of time and effort in, you know, brought into this and that space is there. And I know it's utilized. Mm -hmm. I'm not saying it's not. But I'm focused on kids and, and school, so totally. thought I'd throw it out there. Thank you. Thanks. <clears throat> Other board members? Uh, Ms. Rowe, before you uh, go, I'd like to have comments if no one else that hasn't spoken. Um, again, I just wanted to uh, reiterate what my colleagues have said, and I appreciate all the work that you all have been doing. Um, I also want to say that I've visited multiple times um, many of these schools. Um, and again, recently, to, to see the conditions. Um, I've recently, I visited Halstead, Cromwell Valley, Hampton Elementary School, Pleasant Plain, Stonely, and Pine Grove Elementary School. And one of the things that's evident is that there are dedicated, wonderful administrators and teachers that care about the children in their schools, that care about the families, and there's some amazing teaching and learning that's going on. The other thing that's evident is Pleasant Plains needs relief. I went and had lunch at, at 10 30 um, but there was no room in the cafeteria so i sat with the principal in the hallway um, and walked amongst all of the uh, learning cottages and saw the transitions in the hallways and just in the office uh, students and um, parents coming in and out it's it's a very overcrowded school um, it is also evident that we need a longer term solution and that is something that the board is working on. It has been uh, discussed for several years to have a 10-year capacity plan, and uh, it is now underway with the board partnering with the county government. They had an RFP out, a vendor's gonna be selected, and we will be doing a 10-year plan. The first phase is gonna be the high schools, and then the, uh, the secondary schools, excuse me, and then the uh, second phase will be the elementary schools. So for parents and, and um, stakeholders that are concerned about that long-term plan, the board and the school system and the county realize that we need to do more work and the work will continue. So, um, but in the meantime, we do need to make uh, the decisions of how we can uh, address Pleasant Plains <coughs> Elementary School. I did have a couple questions. One of them is, um, does the new Northeast Elementary School provide relief uh, at all in, in this area? That was not part of the study area, um, uh, this particular study area. So, um, that although that provides relief to the to the as part of that process, it was not part of this process. Okay, um, and then you had mentioned that um, you've done 12 projects so far, and what I would um, like to see, and if you don't have it this evening, but it could be something provided to the board, is what is the three to five year success of initial projections based at the decision time and then how those have worked out in the future. Um, we understand that things can change, so it's not, um, as, as Dr. Williams says, we want to use it as a flashlight, not as a hammer, that information. And if the board has to make these dis difficult decisions, we do want to make it with the best information mm -hmm. possible. Um, so I would like to see, um, I would like to see that. And there's also um, the concern that the school board is not in control of and Cropper is not in control of, which is these developments that are unknowns, big question marks coming online. So um, I know that there's um, going to be discussions around that. And that's all I have. And then Ms. Rowe? So, oh, I'm sorry, Ms. Joes. Thank you. Um, you said you had 283 unique respondents. Do you have a breakdown of where those 
um, people responded from? Um, I we do have it. I don't have it in front in front of me, but we did uh, develop a, a survey report that identifies where the respondents come from, and those respondents were um, were respondents provided input from across the study area. So we did have um, respondents from every school. Um, it was heavier weighted in the Hampton area, for the, the respondents, as opposed to um, Pleasant Plains and Halstead, from what I recall. Um, yeah. So we, I have some of that information. Um, 283 responses were received. Survey respondents were asked to identify the school boundary live with the school representation as followed. Halstead, four, Hampton, 192, Pleasant Plains, 84, and other three. Thank you. Uh, and on slide 22, you have, um, where is it? Yes, you have a breakdown of the percent minority in the schools. Do you have that for option C? We do have it. Um, that's something that we have developed. I don't have it in front of me, but uh, that's something that we can certainly give you. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Other board members? Ms. Rowe? I just have one specific question about projections. So we know that at Pleasant Plains, we have September 30th numbers from 2018. And then later in the school year, those numbers exceeded, I believe, the 2024 projection. And I wanted to know that when we come out with the 2019 counts, and I understand that we're going to have um, September 30th numbers for those, but when we start looking at the 2019 projection, are we using the actual schoolhouse numbers that were later in the year last year that are now currently also more for the projections? Because if our September 30th numbers are consistently every year less than what the school has because children enroll in October and November, then it means our projections are going to be consistently based on numbers that are not reflective of the actual student body. And I just wondered if we're taking into account the same way this study took into account the actual numbers, if when we do the projected numbers in the student count book, if we're taking into account the actual numbers for the starting year one following year projection. When we look at projections, we, we use the September 30th count as the official enrollment. As part of the decision making for the school system, whether we're looking at staffing or whether we're looking at uh, making some adjustments over the summer, we do take a look at enrollment as it changes over the course of the year. But for the purposes of the study, we always start with the September 30th count and we utilize that. Um, and as we move through the study, as in this study, starting in meeting two, we provided the unofficial information so that the committee would have that information. I guess my concern is when we get the student count book, mm -hmm. is the stu and I, I understand the student count book will have the September 1930th numbers as the September 1930th numbers. But when I call the principal at Pleasant Plains and find out how many children actually attend the school, Am I going to be able to look down the row and see that that number is the projected number for 2024, even though we knew from the last book right. that they already exceeded that? Or are we adjusting the project projections based, because it seems to me when I look at the book that what we're doing is we're going, oh, here's the 18 numbers. Let's apply the formula for projections to the 18 numbers and just up all the numbers, as opposed to saying the projections should start from the actual October or November numbers that the school is already at projected numbers four or five years out. And I think one of the unique things about BCPS is that it's a school system that's growing. And so we're projected to really welcome 1,000 students each year. With that, bring some irregularities and anomalies to the projections because there are some groups of students and some families that come, and there isn't a predictable pattern within which we can then establish projections. So what we try to do is have as a base the September 30th numbers, and then we have our online systems in which principals can look at that information and they can 
can use that for decision making. We also work with our central offices, our um, strategic planning office, and what they constantly do is work with um, SAGE to see where we need to establish rules and exceptions for those patterns that aren't predictable. So it is an ongoing process, it's something that, con that continues, but for some groups of students, there isn't a predictability because if whether there's turnover because of the community or whether it's just because of the uniqueness of the families, we always can't specifically predict for this particular group of students or this particular area, here's what it's going to look like because the communities are changing. So part of my concern is that our count book is what's used to approve <laughs> developments. So if our count book is consistently wrong in the projections, then if we're projecting our schools to have fewer students than what they actually ultimately have, then developments are going to be approved in those school zones based on those projections and not based on what's actually in the schools. So because our count book is used for more than just school-based decisions, I'm concerned that the county council and the hearing examiners who approve developments are using our inaccurate account book to approve developments. So what I will share with you is that our, uh, our students count is not inaccurate. What I will share, what I am saying is that we do have a projection methodology that we utilize. We have to create rules and we have to create anomalies because there are some groups that are, that are not predictable. And as a result of that, when we have the students count, we update the information and we are able to share that information with the county if they ask us because that's static in terms of one point in time, the students count book. But we have a strong partnership with county planning and if they need information relative to current enrollment or any anomalies, we've met with them and we've talked with them about um, where in some of these groups um, it's unpredictable because they're coming into our school system and it's, it's difficult for us to be able to look ahead and say, for this particular group um, of residents, here's how we can project out. We've met with them and we've talked with them. I think we have about 25 different exceptions. So we've even looked at changing some of the methodology because we have all of these exceptions to the rules. But it is a dynamic process, it's always changing. So student counts is one point in time, but we have a strong relationship with them and we are making changes and adjustment based on what we see in our schools.